welcome everyone uh, to our regular June board meeting of the board. Uh, the uh, first agenda item is, uh, are there any, uh, uh, well, there, there are no guest speakers. Are there any uh, members who wish to exercise their right to speak? And again, I do not see anybody with a raised hand that has indicated that at this point they would like to speak. Okay, well then we'll move on to the uh, minutes of the May 21st board meeting, which are in the board book, starting on page one. Uh, are there any uh, alterations on page one? Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five, page six, page seven. You no, know, it's just, yeah. I don't know which page is six and seven, because I'm going through. But top of the page, section, start section 2.3, right. is that six or seven? Right. Six. So six. six. Just if you go down one, two, three, four, five paragraphs, it says, Mr. Garrity commented that some associations, I think we want to say in there, either community associations or sub associations. Okay. Because it may sound like it's outside the doors. Sure. Okay. So you want to just say you commented some so, association? So, yeah, I think so. That's okay. Bad. All right. Thank you. Page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Page ten. And page eleven. No, uh, no changes uh, beyond that already made. Is there a motion to uh, approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone aye. aye. And, uh, thank you, Linda, for that marathon. Uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, Let's move on to the general manager's report, Donald. Sure, so good morning. Um, Mrs. Safranek, are you getting a message to it continue on your screen by any chance? I am not. Um, in terms of hit continue on. It says what this is being recorded. Let me just see. It is being recorded. Right. Yeah, we got a big, we got a big sign. There we go. We're good. We're good. I just don't want to mess you up. There we go. We can see you better. Dude. Very good. <coughs> that was on our side. You may not have been able to see it. So. I, I was not able to see that. Perfect. Okay. Well, good morning. And um, first and foremost, with regard to operations, um, we are ticking down to where we're going to have um, the golf course completely closed. And one of the items that um, we've we want to address uh, with the staff and with the with the membership is what our hours of operation will be um, for that six or seven week period when we're, we're without golf completely. And so what we've been what we're doing right now internally is we're we're trying to gauge um, the what the members' behaviors have been for the summer and what they're going to be because as you all know um, at the last board meeting was when we lifted the mask mandates. And um, this summer is very different than uh, any summers in previous years, in many years. And so we're, we're doing some little straw uh, poll surveys, things like that to find out, you know, how the members are gonna use the club during that period of time before we just say, okay, we're gonna be open, closed for this period of time, um, so on and so forth. And at our staff meeting this coming week, we'll be able to create a plan on what those specific hours of operation will be, what type of food service, if any, will be available on certain days um, and, and, and be able to operate that way. Currently, we have um, nice participation on Friday evenings, which is great. We have um, some Mahjong and card players who are starting to come back to the club during the week and, and have lunch. And um, now that we're offering those services, we, we certainly don't wanna just take them away. So we want to take the approach that, you know, based on the, uh, the numbers of people that are using the club, um, what days they're using it most, what hours they're using it most, and, and help that drive um, those decisions. 
up right now, uh, because we do have nine holes of golf, we are we're, we have some pretty good play here on Tuesdays uh, and Saturdays. We also um, are having play with the pros at other clubs outside of Foxfire, which is getting, which is getting nice participation. We have a, um, a, a road trip to Streamsong that we're testing the waters with to see how many members would like to take a road trip for, for a, a, a night, over, night stay at Streamsong Resort with 36 holes of golf. So um, the programming is, is kind of evolving as we um, go through the changes that we've, 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 we've had uh, these last several weeks. So most likely the uh, dinner service will, during the, during the time we have no golf, most likely the dinner service will probably be only Friday evenings. And if we do do a hard close um, for two or three weeks, I'd like to coordinate that around whether or not we're going to be able to um, resurface our kitchen floor, because that is something that we would like to do this summer. Uh, it's just a matter that the um, the contractors who do that kind of work are, are scarce <laughs> right, right, right now in this area. But um, again, we're trying to incorporate the members' feedback to, to really determine, you know, what we what we should do, especially during that uh, closure. In the meantime. Um, Several of our part-time uh, employees uh, will be uh, taking their vacations during that time. Our full-time employees will be taking most of their vacations during that time. So I think we're gonna have a nice balance of um, what we can offer and which days um, we should stay open, which days we should close. So that's kind of a hot item for summer right now. We're also working on our golf calendar and social calendar for next year. And a lot of work has already been done by the social committee, Helena, Stephen, the golf committee. Um, but the uh, unknown of the permitting process and the disruptions that we're going to have, there are some events that um, we may say, you know, having it this, this fall, like the three day men term, I guess, may not make sense because if we don't have 27 holes open by the time we anticipate having them open, or if the bocce course and tennis courts are under construction, there's all kinds of materials staged. We just want to have the right approach and, and things that we can back out of as opposed to uh, things that we get locked into and then we end up with a with, with mess on our hands. So those are two of the um, primary things that we're, we're kind of focusing on right now. The status of the um, projects, the golf course project, um, right now, the, the new nine has the entire irrigation system installed and the entire nine has been uh, sprayed uh, and sodded. Um, and we're now at the grow-in stage. And we've, we've added our first fertilizer application last week. We will most likely start mowing um, in the next 10 days and, and, start, and start mowing that out. Uh, once we mow it a few times, because it's going to be very sparse, the grass, the density, then we'll come in and we'll actually start rolling the entire golf course to smooth out any of the undulation that shouldn't be there. Um, but that golf course is on track. We, um, we've gotten some very nice rains over the last few days, which is, which is certainly going to help the grow in. And uh, we're expected to see some more sun uh, this weekend, which is equally important to grow Bermuda grass. So uh, everything is working very well out there. Um, the installation, the laser leveling of the tees, the work that we did around the, uh, around the drainage inlets um, has all gone up very well. And um, things are really starting to shape up on the new nine. On the blue golf course, we have almost all the main line in. We'll have the, we started doing the lateral lines on the blue golf course. And we also this week have started the uh, installation to hook up to the pump house, which means we'll start filling the main line and start testing the main line with pressure and, and water and uh, be able to start watering certain holes as we, as we install those lateral lines. We are still on track to uh, move to the uh, original front nine that first week of July. And because the first week of July is the holiday weekend, um, our goal is to keep the golf course open through the 4th of July. Um, 
most likely uh, the GT will uh, have the holiday on Monday, the 5th. And therefore, um, if we can leave the golf course open, keep the golf course open the 4th and 5th, we'll do that. So we have a meeting with them uh, every other week. So we have a major meeting with them this Wednesday to clear up any of those details. In the meantime, our staff is planning on having a 4th of July event. And um, it's again, it's one of those things that if, if it turns out that uh, GT is going to be disrupting the golf course on the first as we originally anticipated, then we can pull back. But uh, I believe that we'll be able to keep the golf course open through the fourth. As we're running all the main line and the laterals on the um, blue nine, we are also doing the shaping, the rough shaping of hole number nine red green, nine blue green, the new uh, short game practice facility, um, and the fairway on nine, on uh, one blue and on nine blue. Uh, after just consulting with the golf course architects, we felt that there was a lot of card paths that could be removed and not replaced um, just because it would provide a better aesthetic. And, um, you know, the way we we're using our scatter program and the members driving in the fairways, it's working very well. And if we can avoid uh, card paths crossing the fairways, that's wonderful. So we've removed car paths on one blue across the fairway, uh, one, uh, one silver, seven red, where we'll bring a waste area closer to the tees and drive up the left side, uh, seven blue, and there's one other that we're thinking about, and that is six red. So um, that work is all underway. The shaping of uh, the one blue fairway and creating a par four uh, really looks spectacular. We had our first um, site visit with Hills Forest Smith a couple of weeks ago, uh, where they will come out and, and uh, basically make sure that the plans coincide with what is being built. And, uh, <coughs> there are modifications that have to be made in the field, and that's what we are doing. One of the most significant modifications that we're, we're actually going to do is on the short game practice area, we're going to flip where the chipping green, one of the chipping greens is in the, um, the actual putting green. We just felt that once they were out here and they could see how the space laid out, we were gonna be better off to put the practice putting green in a similar, similar location to where it was before and keep the chipping and pitching greens on their own, which will be basically behind number one blue tee. And so they redesigned that. Our shaper James is reshaping that they're going to come in on Monday so we can get the um, elevations approved. And on Tuesday, we'll start draining, uh, putting all the drainage systems in for the greens, the bunkers, and that entire short game practice area. Meanwhile, GT will be finishing up the lateral lines on uh, the other holes on the blue golf course. And our goal is that by uh, the beginning of the week of the, um, let me just see here. Get my dates. For some reason, I keep skipping it a week in June. But let me just see here. Our goal is that the week of the 28th, that we'll actually be able to have them install the irrigation around the new practice, no short game practice area, uh, one blue fairway, and nine blue up to where they have to terminate because we have to wait for the bulkhead wall installation. With regard to the bulkhead wall, uh, we do have all of the materials for the bulkhead wall on site. Uh, that, of course, as we've said all along, that is contingent on the site plan and the ERP permit being approved. Um, we have had a number of conversations with our engineers, and they have had um, uh, conversations with South Florida Water Management District. At this point in time, um, and as of yesterday afternoon, they are going to resubmit the plans um, on Monday. And based on the feedback that I received yesterday, they felt as though South Florida Water Management District was going to be very cooperative with this review as far as um, expediting it. So that's a great sign. We, we know that they do have 30 days to review, which is fine. The issue is that upon that 30 day review, they also have 30 days to issue the permit, which we're trying to skip over, but um, but but as of right now, um, those things are looking good. We're prepared for those that that installation whenever that gets approved, and then also um, 
along with the, the, that, we also have, um, we'll, we'll also start moving to, to work on the driving range as well. So even though we'll have to leave nine blue and nine red um, in a rough fashion until the bulkhead wall is built from the short game practice area and hole number one blue, we're gonna jump over inside the building and redoing the driving range target greens and keep moving along. So the, 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 the um, whole process has been very fluid. Uh, Universal Underground, our Schaefer James Harbuck, uh, GT Irrigation, everybody's worked very well together in very, a very really coordinated fashion. And um, it's, got, it's, it's really starting to take shape out there. It, it, it truly is. But it, it is, it, there's, there's a long way to go, but up to this point, I think that our members should be very satisfied with where we are. Can I ask just one question? Yeah. The um, uh, demolition and reconstruction of the tennis courts in the Nubachi, is that being held up because of the bulkhead problem? <clears throat> yeah, so what we're actually, what we can do is we can demo the tennis courts without the site plan. Yeah. We just can't rebuild those, but we're actually gonna start demoing those. That, you got, that was my next point. So <laughs> we're actually gonna start demoing the tennis courts on Monday. Okay. And um, we, that today, uh, Universal has actually started removing all the vegetation because we to, that was our responsibility to remove all the vegetation around the tennis courts. Mm -hmm. And then um, US Tennis is gonna be here on Monday to start their portion of the demo. Their portion of the demo, we estimate will take a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and then there will be a gap be before they can start just because again, that site plan does have to be approved before they can gotcha. reconstruct. Okay. Um, just to sit here, uh, um, vegetation landscaping. I know you cut down the one bushes. Are, are we saving those? Yeah. So okay. yeah. So what we're going to do exactly? So everything that was along. I'm glad you asked this. Everything that's along the parking lot um, between the parking lot, the main parking lot, and the tennis, we actually did. We cut them back, mm -hmm. knowing that if we cut them back early on and we prune the root through them up, they would they would survive. And so what we're going to use that what those those um, cocoa plum for is we're going to heavily vegetate um, some of the areas on that Rich King Parkway that are that are under vegetated that are behind our members homes and then also along the Foxmore fence line we're gonna there's a we, we have a lot of cocoa plum there but we're gonna bulk, bulk that up um, and actually run a new we actually set a connection so that we can run a new line down that fence line on Foxmore so we can really dense that that area up and create a nice buffer between Flamingo then you get the good rain this time. Which exactly. Hurt. The other side where the ficus are, they're coming out. The, so the ficus, the ficus on the tennis court side are coming out, and then those are going to be those are exotic. They're basically exotic. Now those, so and they they wouldn't survive. They're too big. So we're rid of the root system. Yeah, so we're works. getting rid of those. Okay. Um, there's a new. There will be a new planting along that side. The ficus that's on the um, villa side will remain, um, unless the county were to make us take that out. But that will remain for that privacy buffer. If they if they were to take make us take it out because it, it's it's a ficus, then we would probably replace it with a Kalusha or something like that. But we want to maintain that buffer between Villas One and the tennis court for the for the for the um, owners over there. But um, but yes, there's a lot of uh, wood crackling right now. Those ficus, <laughs> it's snap and half. It would be an advantage for them to get uh, the Kalusha. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, no question. No, absolutely, part of your plant, and you don't have the white fly issue. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. So um, as I said, GTI um, Universal. One of the one of the shifts we've made is um, just so, so everyone here knows about it, is that um, <coughs> keeping Universal involved uh, more for this project than we originally anticipated is, is actually uh, making a lot of sense for us. And the reason is is that we're going to bring them in for at least a month or six weeks to do different work. But because of the the uh, the, the limitations on rental equipment. There's a lot of equipment that if we rented it directly, and we have rented a number of pieces of equipment, but if we rent it directly from um, some of our suppliers, a lot of that equipment will end up sitting there where, and we, we, we'll need it for 10 days, but we have to pay for it for a month. And, and, and so having Universal on board with operators is, is actually gonna make the entire process that much more efficient. They're the ones who actually moved all the dirt for us, brought the, those trucks in. So um, it's all within our budget uh, confines, but it's just a matter that when we started looking at 
the piece of equipment that we have to rent and keep on site for the next four months, as opposed to using, having them and having them assist with drainage, which is their specialty and these other items. It's just, it's just a lot more efficient. It makes a lot more sense for us. So uh, they've done a great job. And um, when it comes to the, even the card path removal, the, 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 the removal of power paths can be very, very expensive, extremely expensive. And, and um, the, the equipment they have, we can do that removal and dump, put it in dumpsters as a paint, as opposed to paying a separate contractor to do that and then paying a markup on top of it. So um, there are a lot of efficiencies that we are, are um, able to uh, appreciate by, by keeping, them on, keeping them on site. Um, the amenity master plan, as I mentioned, the uh, the tennis and bocce, the, the, the tennis is going to start um, the uh, the demolition this week. U.S. tennis, the permitting it was as I had stated earlier, and that is that we are going for our third submittal to Collier County, second submittal to South, to South Florida Water Management District, and we're very confident that that this um, submittal is going to be satisfactory. Uh, to all parties, and our goal is to get that turned around as soon as possible. With MHK, our, our architects, we have released them to start construction drawings on the halfway house. We were in a position a few weeks back where pretty much the halfway house was um, in a position where they could do construction drawings, but there were a couple of minor up updates that we wanted to make sure got on those plans. They are currently updating the plans for the for the um, card barn and fitness center, along with the grill room, and we hope to meet with them in the next couple of weeks to finalize that that those plans so that they can move forward with construction drawings. And this is really when I say construction drawings, it's all the 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 um, architecturals, the uh, electrical engineering, all the plumbing, so on and so forth, and so. It's not the, the the fun stuff. It's not the pretty stuff. It's just getting getting all the all the items in line that have to be taken care of um, for bidding. We for, for bidding, for bidding, and for and for um, permitting. And that's about where we are. Okay. Anything of importance in this uh, Hills Forest Smith? Letter the we put a, the copy was in the board. Yeah, I, I put a I put a copy in I put a copy in there just so you have a reference on okay. it, and that's it, so you understand like you know when they when they when they do their site when they come out to their site visits that you know they they want to document everything that we discussed. Now since that site visit, we did make a couple of adjustments because once you got on on a computer and looked at the layout, it's like well let's let's switch where the putting green is and the chipping green. We're not losing either component. It's just a matter of flipping them for for efficiencies. But it, and it gives the shaper a reference of so that um, he can, even though they're doing the walkthrough together, the shaper can say, okay, yeah, I have to trim this by a foot and a half. I could lift this up a couple of feet, so on and so forth. But it was just a matter to to reference so that you know when we get invoices for site visits, you know what we're getting invoices for. Okay. <laughs> yes. It's impressive that you've got these uh, various companies and operations all coordinated. Jonathan on the operations side and Jeremy are on the operations side. They're tied in beautifully. Uh, you've got a, an outside contractors like uh, Universal and uh, like uh, 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 James Harbach. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just, it's masterful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for getting that set up. Thank you. It certainly is, Mr. Well, I had the opportunity to be part of this uh, um, visit by Hills Forest Smith. And uh, at a level of uh, professionalism and understanding and cooperation uh, was really remarkable. And uh, we're fortunate to have this group of uh, people who uh, have that spirit of working together. Okay. All right. Uh, when we move on to the controller's report. Okay. Well, the good news is, <laughs> in about two months, I won't have to give the controller's report any longer, <laughs> because um, we have successfully hired a controller who will start in the in most likely the middle of July. 
Her name is Victoria Gabriel. She's a CPA. She actually uh, works for Moorings Park right now. She's a director of finance there. Uh, she's got a wonderful um, background and our search committee did a preliminary interview um, with her and suggested that I interview her, which I followed up and had two interviews. And I think she's gonna be a wonderful fit and a great <coughs> asset to Foxfire um, going forward. And um, one of, a couple things of note is that she actually did work for our auditors at one time, RSM, and she was recommended by our auditor, Phil Newman. So that gave us a lot of, um, of satisfaction to know that she was very, uh, uh, someone that, that they didn't want to lose. The reason she actually left RSM was because she was recruited by somebody at Moor, Moorings who had worked with her previously. Uh, she's got a, a, a very nice temperament, uh, personality, has an uh, outstanding background in finance, and I think she'll be a wonderful fit um, for this very, very, very important position. And um, it's a, it's very, it's very semi, it's a it's semi sweet because it's, uh, it's something that uh, I thought that I would probably have to hire a controller two or three years from now. Um, but then the circumstance with Pam, um, that was obviously uh, accelerated. But uh, it's certainly something where I'm thrilled for I'm thrilled for Foxfire. <clears throat> I'm thrilled for Victoria, um, but there's 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 a there's a sadness too, because it's a it's a it's 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 a moving moving in a new direction which we're forced to do. So, um, uh, Victoria actually uh, knew Pam was very fond of Pam, and her first email to me was how sorry she was for our loss. So um, I think we've got the right person with the right skill set to uh, pick up where Pam left off and do a great job for the next several years. So that's the first portion of the controller's report. Overall, from our financials, um, our friend from financially, we're in, we're in excellent position. Um, all of our uh, board, we, we, you all have the financial statements as of April 30th. Overall, we're approximately $300,000 better than budget. A couple of the key areas um, why, why this is, is number one, our new owner transfer fees have absolutely exploded since the, um, since the approval of the golf course and many master plans, along with the desire for so many people to move to Florida. Uh, it certainly complemented that. So our new owner transfer fees have really helped and come at the right time, especially since uh, golf revenues and uh, F&B revenues uh, during a COVID year are actually about $300,000 below budget. Another factor that's contributing to this is the excellent management of expenses by all of our department heads, um, especially when it comes to payroll. Uh, the pro shops payroll is $40,000 better than budget year to date through April. Uh, golf course, $14,000 better than budget year to date. Restaurant, $74,000 better than budget year to date. So the department managers do an outstanding job as always, uh, controlling expenses and, and avoiding costs wherever they can. Um, there are a few items here that I just want to note, just so that it's, it's, it's on record. And that is, with a golf course, it's really because of food and beverage and the um, pro shop, because of those deficits in the revenue, the, that's really made up basically by administration primarily from new owner transfers and transfer fees being up and by the, the um, golf course being $150,000 better than budget as well. But one thing that's very important to note is that on the golf course, the expenses that are um, better than budget are our, our expenses that we will have going forward. It's not that this really has more to do with the fact that because we're under construction and because uh, we're not having to use the chemicals and the fuel and, and the fertilizers 
that we've been using that we would normally use up to this point of the year because we killed all the grass, those, those costs will come back online. So it's not like they're gonna go away forever or even for the rest of this fiscal year because now that the golf course is growing in, we are gonna have to fertilize, we are gonna have to top dress, we're gonna have to do those things. So we are in excellent financial position. We are, we are at a surplus right now, but as I look at May and forecast June, July, August, and September with um, having no golf for a, a period of six to seven weeks, with having one golf course for another you know, uh, six or seven weeks, um, it's, it's highly likely that um, a lot of that will be, the surplus will be chewed up and that's just reasonable to believe that. But overall, considering the fact that we ran at 50% capacity for the for pretty much the entire, for the entire season um, due to COVID and um, the other limitations that were, that have taken place to be where we are today, um, financially, I think it is really very, very positive and, and a, a, a tribute to the, um, the oversight of the budget by the department heads, the finance committee, and obviously the board. So um, really an excellent condition. Uh, there's, you know, when we get the finance part of Roger's gonna have some comments, I'm sure. But uh, if there's any questions with regard to any of the um, line items on the financials, uh, you can ask me now or ask me later, however, whatever works best for you. And Donald, quick question. Sure. Um, I, I know you said that payroll is better and uh, one of our focuses is to is retention, employee retention. Um, could you address how we are um, still uh, offering a, a, a satisfactory work environment and not cutting hours that, uh, so that we're keeping employees uh, occupied and paid? Yeah, so, so, um, so first and foremost, we, the, the, the payroll, um, the, where, the, where, the, where we haven't spent the money is really in, in the fact that um, we haven't had, because of the way we had to operate. So we didn't really cut our full-time staff by any means. You know, our full-time staff was still fully employed all, all went along. Some of our seasonal staff that would normally come on board um, either came on board later or didn't come back on board at all. And then they'll obviously be back uh, starting in, in the fall. But um, what we'll do during the closure is that no matter how we're, what we do as far as that six or seven week period of time, um, our employees will have the opportunity to work on the golf course, to do other, to do other work with us so that they can earn, um, earn pay. And that was part of our plan all along is that, you know, food and beverage staff, you know, uh, car barn staff, uh, pro shop staff, um, everyone will contribute on basically on the golf course project um, during that closure. But then, uh, then also um, the staff will take their, their personal time, their vacation time. Um, and then some, as I mentioned earlier, will just have decided that Hey, you know what? This I've never, I haven't had, had an extended period of time off. Some of our seasonal people, or I'm sorry, part-time people, I'm going to take that, you know, six weeks off and, you know, spend time with my family. So we are certainly looking after all of the staff. And then with next year's budget, as we'll discuss more in detail next week, um, we are making accommodations for not only the current staff but the future staff that we're going to hire to make to ensure. Um, that we're providing not only an excellent environment to work in, but, com but the competitive pay that, that um, the employ all employees are seeking, um, and obviously an excellent benefit um, program as well. So uh, we're, it's kind of a multifaceted approach, but we are certainly looking after our employees um, and want to continue to foster that, you know, that same yeah, approach. I, I wanted to get that on the record. I know that you are doing it and that we are very aware of uh, retain, employee retention, very important. And we don't want to bring in new staff and start training or doing any of that. So I thank watched, you for addressing that. I, I, some, some of us watched that for um, seven and a half years after this new clubhouse was built. It was just a, a swinging door. <laughs> so 
which was very difficult, to, you know. So we, we don't, we definitely don't want to get into that. Absolutely right. not. And we and we like the people who work there. We don't want to lose them. You do a really great job. You do a really great job. The one of the things I would mention too is that we uh, and I did mention this in the operations portion was that we're looking at some of the, the different programs of as far as um, some of the different services that we can do during the closure. So. Um, <clears throat> doing more, getting back more into things where people can order in advance and do like to go like chick, like, you know, uh, eight ounces or a pound or two pounds of chicken salad or tuna salad. So we're starting to put some things like that out there as well, um, just to kind of change our operation and, and kind of, and, and work with, you know, what we're dealing with uh, during this next, you know, couple of months. So uh, hopefully the members will support those programs, which I think they will. And um, that obviously will, help all the employees, especially in F and B. So, yeah. Next on the uh, controller's report is our um, capital request. Now, the items that are identified here, um, they're, they're, I'll start with the laptop computers. Uh, first and foremost, the laptop computer that we're using, we've been using in here for the last a couple of years. It's one of our older laptops and um, is is not up to par with um, the technology today. And so the, these laptop computers would be new items. We did not uh, schedule these, but we felt uh, that with our financial position that this is the best time to go ahead and purchase these laptops. Uh, one of the laptops would be um, a portable workstation for our new controller so that if she had to do work from home, she has a desk a laptop that she'll have that's capable of having all of our programs on it. And that if she had to work from home for whatever reason it might be, um, that would be something that uh, we would have. So the laptop computers are a new item. The other new item here, which wasn't listed in our original reports when we built the budget, a year ago are the time clocks. We have three time clocks, uh, one in the cart barn, one in the kitchen, and one at the golf course maintenance facility. And those time clocks, um, they're, they're hand print time clocks. Well, the one in the cart barn needs to be repaired and the repair for that time clock is $650. So we thought, well, rather than spend $650 on repairing one time clock, that the other ones will both end up having the same issue why not just replace all of them with the updated technology now and put that to bed? So those two items were not scheduled um, capital uh, purchases when we built the budget last year. However, they're items that we certainly feel we want to get them now, and we certainly definitely are in a financial position to do so. The six workstations and six monitors, those are... Um, workstations that we had planned on replacing this year, this summer, and those were scheduled um, for replacement and budgeted accordingly. They are replacement items. Those workstations and monitors are for the office. And then all of the workstations in the office will be used for um, to update the pro shop and the food and beverage computer systems. And that's generally what we do is that we'll, we'll as we do the upgrade in the office, those systems are normally better than the ones in the other parts of the operation. And therefore we can upgrade, it's an upgrade all around. Um, then of course, um, we have the golf course maintenance. These two items have been um, uh, budgeted for replacement this year. And the one's a, 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 a surround mower and the other one is a rough mower. And the important thing here with these two mowers is number one, the mowers that we have that they're replacing are um, anywhere from you know eight to 15 years old and beyond their useful life. But also these mowers are actually real mowers. And, when, and the reason we want real mowers is be, uh, and they're R-E-E-L mowers. The reason we <laughs> Okay, oh, thank you. <laughs> the reason. Uh, yeah, what were we using before? <laughs> yeah, they're old yeah. mowers. The reason we want real mowers is that in the past, because of the type of grass that we have on in the roughs, in the roughs, we had to use rotary mowers, and a rotary mower is similar to what you do 
use mowing your own lawn. At home. Right, so that's a rotary and this is a real. And it's a real mower like we use on the greens and on the tees. And with the cell, with the, I'm sorry, with the uh, bimini uh, grass, the fact that that grass doesn't create a seed head, which is, yeah. you don't have to use, you can get a much cleaner cut and we don't need a rotary mower with the grass that we had because it would have what we would call it, what we call a seed head. A real mower wouldn't cut that. You could run over it 30 times and you'd still have pieces of grass sticking up. So um, the, the, with Bimini, we want to be able to real mow, use a real mower on all of our roughs and obviously on our fairways and, 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 um, and tees and greens. So needless to say, there are items that had to be replaced anyways. We're, we're, we're upgrading with real mo uh, with real reels instead of rotaries. And then the other thing is with that, John just came to see me right before the, the meeting started. And if you look at page, if you look at page 28 in your board book where it has a description of the cost, we actually just got, we were actually going to be able to reduce that by another $4,500 um, because John Deere is actually going to give us $4,500 for the two pieces of equipment that we're going to trade in. So instead of a hundred and, you know, $12,000, it's going to be, or one hundred twelve five, it's going to be $108,000. But um, when you look at that invoice, you'll also see that the, the, the credit of $2,100 in $66. We're part of a, 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 a purchasing program that's called Club, Club Procure. That purchasing program costs us $500 a year and we get rebates for different companies that we do business with. And those rebates exist in golf course equipment, golf course materials, including chemicals and fertilizer, uh, certain pro shop vendors that we use and food and beverage. So that $500 expense um, it, it price in the end helps us avoid spending anywhere from five to 10,000 additional dollars um, every year. Don, we, tell, us, tell us the name of the buying group. It, remember again? It, well, it used to be BGM. It was, mm -hmm. B, it, it right. was BGM and, they, and now, they're called, now it's called Club Procure. And, an outstanding. Yeah. and so we joined that about five years ago and um, the, the discounts far away the, um, the, the, the annual cost of the program, because again, it applies to every facet of our operation. So the, um, the long and short of it is that the computer and laptops, we're looking at a total spend, I'm just gonna round the numbers of $13,000. Again, uh, all of the monitors and workstations were part of the budget. The time clocks are $2,550. Yeah, I kind of like say the best for last, right? Yeah. And, the, and the golf course and the golf course equipment is um, $108,000. And, and that is the, re, the um, request for, per, for purchase. Um, some of these, for example, the golf course equipment, we have to order that so it, it won't be delivered for another four to six weeks. Um, but the other items we want to order right away and get them in use and, and get moving forward. Okay. So you the golf course budgeted and scheduled, so that's that's good. The only thing that was not budgeted and scheduled was the time, time clocks. The time and the, and the, lab, the laptops. It's, it's and the, the laptops. Laptop. Right, right. And the laptops um, are definitely, I mean, they're, they're you know, $5,000, but between the two of them, but they're, they're laptops that can handle all of our desktop, all the things that are on our desktops for, to run the business. So, okay. um, so and they've got the uh, fingerprint ID, finger, fingerprint scan. Yes, that's for the time clocks, the fingerprint scanners. They're not, it's, 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 it's just the thumbprint now, which is nice. That was no. there. It's, it, was, it's, it was a whole hand, oh, really? but the thumbprint. And I believe you can actually use either one of your thumbs. Yeah. Last time I had a time clock, it was 
Cha-ching. Yeah, right. Much better. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're talking about time. Yeah. It's well, interesting. That's it's, nice. It's really, it's nice because, you know, you never get into people punching them. That's right. Each other's in and out. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So we've had fingerprint uh, hand, hand scanners for probably six years or so. But this is thumbprint. And what's nice, too, is right now, the way that network is set up is it's very convoluted and that Helsey has to wait for one file to upload to a master file and then the restaurant files upload and then for her to pull, to pull all the information. Now all three of these time clocks will be interconnected to where all that information is cloud-based and it's right there. Right. Donald, what's the cost of the six workstations in six months? Oh, sorry, sorry. So let me just, it's on all one minute, boys. Let me just go back. Well, wait. Yeah, the, yeah, so you have of the, so the, of the, you're talking, we're talking $7,000, $8,000 for the workstations and monitors, and basically uh, 4000 uh, 4300 for the, for the laptops. It's all on one invoice, mm -hmm. so. And we, the, the, Workstations and monitors that are being replaced will be used in other parts of the yeah. business here. And then, and then, and then the other ones will be disposed of. Okay. Yeah. So they, 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 all of our, we use everything beyond its useful life, mm -hmm. you know. So, but, it, but those other ones we dispose of. Are you looking for a motion to approve these? Yes. I move we approve the purchases both for the computer system and the time clock system as well as the. Purchases uh, for the lawnmowers, the real homes. There's a motion to uh, uh, approve these purchases. Is there a second? I'll second it. Is there any further discussion? All in flavor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. All right, and then the last item that I have is that on, on um, but I did receive an email from our um, branch manager at Lake Michigan Credit Union the other day who we've applied our, through, for our PPP uh, loan, um, our PPP. And um, I, we heard back that the PPP has been completely 100% forgiven. Hmm. So um, we haven't gotten the official paperwork from the Small Business Administration, but the PPP has been forgiven. Um, and just as a reminder that the PPP, um, those funds um, were commingled with our operating, which is what was required, and therefore spent on payroll as the intended use. So, um, but the, the, the key here is that it was, it, it, that became a grant and therefore does not have to be paid back. So um, that's great news. We were allowed to use that on utilities too though, right? We didn't use it for utilities. We, no, did. we did not. We did not. We did okay. not use it for payroll. I know this was a big project participated in by you and Pam and Roger and Lynn Anderson and the Finance Committee and a lot of people to make this happen. When I first heard about it, I thought this was just terrific if it works out and now it has. And so we owe a big debt of gratitude to all of those people sure. who put that time in to essentially get us uh, uh, this grant mm -hmm. from uh, during the COVID. I, I, I want to thank all of them. I just think it was terrific. What a great job. Thank you. And I will say the SBA didn't make it easy, did they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so but still. But we were we were prepared. We were prepared. We had everything in line. That's for sure. Well, the the committee that we set up uh, uh, really uh, worked with Pam to right. ensure that uh, this was thoroughly documented, so that uh, there would be no question when we got to the end of the process that. Uh, we would have followed the rules and would get forgiveness. Yeah, and I, I should say that I was really an observer for nine months. It was, it was, it was the last four months when I got really involved. But but, but Lynn and Dan and Helen. The, the 
Bill's comment about uh, bringing the group together and he formed, formed, formed the group for us, uh, along with Donald and Pam, uh, we documented everything. We are have an obligation to retain that information for the next seven years. Mm -hmm. The SBA could come back someplace five years from now and say, wait a second, we want to look at something. We have all of that information. It's saved. Okay. Do you want to, Donald, you want to, before we get off your report, did you want to talk about foreclosures? Actually, yeah, do you want to talk about, do you want to, uh, do you want to get into that right? That's perfect. Yeah, because I, I, we, I put it, I we just didn't want to forget about it. Yeah, that. we put that under the, the old um, business, but I, I will oh, say. Oh, I, I had, it was under your control. Yeah. Your, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. I'm with the, the proceeding that we just put it under. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll do it under old business. But, but I will mention, I'm sorry, because I, I will mention that um, with regard to, um, the liens and foreclosures, although we, as I mentioned before, there's a, and Mr. Moore will talk about this more uh, later in the agenda, there's actually a lot of the numbers, um, the, the whole numbers of, of um, liens that would be, that are on the books um, are actually, I'm not saying, I shouldn't say liens. The number of delinquent accounts um, is reducing quite significantly, which is great. So, um, the majority of the, uh, the, the the delinquency is really basically from um, three accounts. So, Ooh. sorry about that. You know what that is? That's our electrician testing something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but we could, if you want to talk about that after, we'll that's fine. But we'll talk about it. I I yeah, missed no, it on the no, I, but I didn't mean I didn't mean to say that because I did have that I had that note when I was looking at them because I had Layla print out. An update as of the end of May, and the, the, the total number of delinquencies is, is, is reducing significantly as homes are being sold. Mm -hmm. Let me let me go get this sorted. Bet you're glad you got these lights now. I know, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe we should have spent that PPP money on utilities. I got to have that go dark. <laughs> in the dark. So, are, are the lights off in the building? Is that it? Well, we don't know. We're they're no, they're, they're certainly off here, street. except for the theater lights, which are still on. We're on in the holes. You look great, actually. Uh, I kind of like that lighting. <laughs> Only a TV journalist would understand the value of lighting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it can take years off your age. <laughs> While we're waiting for Donald to return. Uh, I just wanted to uh, specifically thank the, uh, uh, the members of the, uh, the search committee, uh, uh, Jim Moore, Jim Matheny, and uh, Kathy Connors for uh, the work they put in to, uh, to facilitate our uh, finding uh, a new controller. Uh, I think they did a great job and uh, from everything I've heard, uh, uh, Victoria sounds like she's uh, going to be a, a terrific addition to the team here. She will be. I, uh, I'll tell you, I didn't think it was going to uh, be resolved as quickly as it was. We, it, once we interviewed her, I will tell you, I told my other team members, I didn't think we had to interview anymore. I think we should see if we could hire her. She was that good and that qualified. Uh, it was, uh, it was an easy decision to make, and I'm just tickled that she's joining our organization. Sorry about that. Okay. And also for our regular viewers of this program, uh, we did not have to spend the money on the uh, executive search right. company. Right. Yes, at the last meeting, we had authorized up to $30,000, so that's money we didn't have to spend. Mm -hmm. so well done, committee. So the, the, just so you know, the purpose of this, the lights going out is that one of the requests is to replace the electrical panel, mm -hmm. which is on which we had budgeted for. And it just so happened that the electrician came today to test the load count. So, <laughs> so we should be we should be fine for a little while. Okay, well, can we move on to new business? Yes. You want to discuss the pedestrian gate? Certainly. And Mrs. Safranic, were you able to load those up? There you go. There we go. Beautiful. Look at them. How about that? that? So that's a view from, uh, from Rich King back to Foxfire. And so the um, the pedestrian gate is in, has been installed. We are, um, we've put some vegetation to dress it up on our side. 
uh, we'll, we'll add some more as well. We're also gonna um, clean it up and make more of a walkway and cut in the curb so you can see it. But what's nice is basically if you're, if you're anywhere around the club, anywhere about around the pool, when you look, you can actually see it's visible, mm -hmm. which is very nice so that it's not hidden and mm -hmm. obstructed. Um, the code is C5678, C5678, which will be published in our um, box deals and email. Uh, it's on, and it's on both sides. They are self-closing hinges. Uh, uh, it's a very dur durable and sturdy gate. And then um, we'll also, going forward, we'll be up updating the camera and the, the, um, the, the uh, video monitoring of that gate. But it's installed, it works really well. And now our members have access to Rich King uh, without having to leave the community. And uh, it's a nice amenity. Yeah, so, great, thank you. Thank you. It's true. Uh, that video monitoring, where this, where who's monitoring the video? Where does so that go? We've got to upgrade. We've got to do an, a, total, a total upgrade over there. So um, mm -hmm. we we would we're going to tie it into our uh, our budget for the the next year, and it's going to be through DHART. DHART does all of our monitoring for okay. our alarm system, and. Mm -hmm in the clubhouse have to be updated as well. So the idea is to tie it all together and then it'll all be in our electrical room. And then you'll be able to, anybody with access will be able to look on their phones and so on and so forth. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, utilization of the website. Did you want to mention it? Yeah. The, uh, um, the march of technology uh, continues and uh, uh, we are trying to uh, move in the direction of uh, getting members to use the website more and more. Uh, we spend a lot of money on the uh, foxtails, uh, printing it in the directory. And uh, uh, for many members, uh, they're willing to uh, get it online. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is encourage more and more members uh, to get it online. Uh, particularly the foxtails, you know, if people want a hard copy, they can print it uh, on their own com uh, printers uh, at home. But uh, we can save uh, probably $30,000 a year between the foxtails and the directory uh, if we can uh, drive more members uh, to uh, use the website for those sorts of communications. So the, uh, you know, everything the communications committee is doing uh, to push things in that direction uh, uh, will be helpful. And, uh, you know, we, our goal uh, for uh, the, the next board election is uh, to conduct it electronically as well. So, um, you know, all these uh, mailing costs uh, are tremendous. Uh, we'll be mailing every member a copy of the budget in July. Uh, and, you know, that's a sizable document. To, uh, and, and the postage expenses are considerable. So uh, not to mention the, the paper involved and the time consumed printing it all and collating it and everything. So um, uh, we wanna support the uh, efforts of the communications committee in, in moving in this direction. Um, and uh, in, Light of the budget, uh, uh, Roger, did you want to make any comments? Um, Bill, I'll save that for the financial report. That okay. We, have time for. Yeah, uh, we will have a special board meeting uh, uh, next Thursday at nine o'clock in the morning uh, to uh, review the budget uh, uh, and uh, approve sending it to the members. We're not approving uh, the actual budget, we're just approving sending it to the members in, its, uh, in, in the form that uh, uh, is acceptable to the board. Um, let's move on to old business, uh, the uh, ad hoc smoking committee survey. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cornetta. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to thank two individuals who were instrumental in helping me create this survey. Mindy Whitehouse, whose experience, guidance and support 
from suggesting the precise wording of the questions to editing everything resulted in a survey which provided us with an excellent end product. <clears throat> I worked with Mindy on the food and beverage survey when I first was appointed to the communications committee and I learned so much from her at that point. Melissa Kay was my cheerleader during this whole process, encouraging me on. So I wanna thank Mindy and Melissa for, um, for their help and support. Our smoking ad hoc committee consisted of members who are smokers, married to a smoker, non-smokers, former smokers. We approached members who were recommended to us. We selected members to this committee randomly and without prejudice. Some members were asked to who were asked to join respectfully declined. And I'd like to thank our smoking committee for their thoughtful review of the results and their recommendations and guidance as we work through the results. The smoking survey email to our members was conducted at the request of the construction and house committees. The grill room space is being reconfigured with windows that will open out onto the patio. The space presently designated as smoking, smoking section will no longer comply with Florida statutes governing smoking as per Fox Fire's attorney. We fielded this survey to 1,204 members. We received in excess actually uh, of 638 replies. We wanted to better understand our members' views on the issue of smoking at Foxfire. And thank you to all our members who participated in the survey and added their verbatim comments. With this level of participation, the survey is pointing toward a sampling that represents a margin of error of the overall community of 90 to 95% accuracy of the general population with a low of confidence of 95 plus or minus uh, confidence level as per Roger Saunders, who has experience in survey analytics. The goal of this smoking survey is to gain insight into our community smoking habits and attitudes toward the smoking overall. We were looking for results that were actionable and enforceable. In making our recommendations, we wanted to show respect for the smokers and non-smokers in our community. We considered the Foxfire culture we consulted with Foxfire's attorney, Steve Falk, and the rural chairman, Chris Jackstadt. And I'll bring up the survey now, hopefully, God willing, right? Uh, let me see here. This should not be so hard. There we go. <clears throat> um, and I just, again, want to emphasize that this survey was completely anonymous. We did not collect any member numbers or names. We wanted to give members the opportunity to be completely honest and candid in their answers. So let's quickly walk through the survey. Um, we started with four base questions to give us an idea of the audience that was responding. How long have you been a member at Foxfire? Um, you can see here that um, more than, you know, 58, 50% um, have been here 10 years or more. Um, so it's, it's a good across the board sampling of members that have been here for a while and are newer. The second question, typically, how many months do you reside at Foxfire? Uh, I don't think there's a lot of surprise here when you look at that. Uh, the largest category is the four to seven months. Um, you know, 20, almost 22% were year round residents. And um, mm -hmm. we had a few new members also. The uh, how often do you use Foxfire's dining room and grill room for social interactions in, in, in a typical month during season? And we, we wanted to emphasize that is not during the pandemic portion. And I was surprised that, you know, people responded more than 12, 12 times or more. It, it, was a, it was a huge response. So as, as Donald knows, uh, it, it, it can get very busy in there um, many times. And when dining at Foxfire, do you enjoy outdoor options when they are offered? And of course there was a resounding yes here. And you know, with the new outdoor casual dining, um, members will even have more space to be able to enjoy the outdoors. At this point, the next question took members down two paths. 
depending on how they answered this question. Are you a smoker who uses tobacco-based products, including cigarettes, cigars, pipes, electronics, uh, electronic cigarettes, vaping, and or uh, chewing tobacco? And we have less than 12% that said, yes, they are smokers. 88% said they are not smokers. So these next questions were answered by members that responded, yes, that they are smokers. Please check the box below, which indicates where you smoke and use tobacco-based products within the Foxfire campus. Check all that apply. Um, the golf course and riding around the golf course um, when you're golfing in your cart uh, were the two largest categories, which again, was not a surprise. When, when our committee reviewed a lot of this, we said we were not surprised about what we were seeing. That was our sense. Uh, so smokers do actively smoke in different areas of the campus, but the golf course and their golf courts or at golfing were the two largest categories. Um, when golfing, which of the family forms of smoking is your preferred choice? Again, the cigars, you know, being a cultural golf type uh, activity, um, it did not surprise us that, that, that cigars came up as, as the largest, but there were certainly other people that, you know, do you smoke out on the golf course, you know, cigarettes and vaping and things like that. Um, are you aware of the designated smoker friendly areas on the Fox Fair campus? Uh, I was surprised that as many people said yes, that they were. Um, clearly the, like the grill room, north patio, front main clubhouse entrance and the fitness center entrance because they have containers there for cigarettes are designated smoking areas. Should smoking be completely prohibited on the entire Foxfire campus? Now, again, this is being answered by smokers. Uh, and this, again, is no surprise. But it, I was surprised that some answered yes, even though they're smokers. So, but again, the majority said no. Should smoking be allowed in these designated areas? Uh, again, these are smokers. Smoking should be allowed in these designated areas. These are smokers. Again, the golf course, um, you know, driving range, putting, you know, grill room patio. So in some sort of dining uh, capacity. Um, the next question that, so the next question goes to non-smokers who said they do not smoke. So this is a different, these are different sets of questions. And so what we, now, let me just go back here. This question here, should smoking be allowed in these designated areas? This question was also asked of the non-smokers at the end. And, and we'll get to that because that was the most telling part of this survey when we did analysis. So the non-smokers, their first question was, do you mind riding in a golf cart with, smoker, with members who smoke? And again, a resounding yes, but some said no, you know, and I think that sometimes has to do with how smokers handle the situation with people that they're riding with when they smoke, uh, being respectful. Do you mind asking the question? Do you mind being seated in a designated smoking area on social occasions with members who smoke? You know, almost 90% said yes. And, um, you know, in, in, in the United States, restaurants do not allow smoking even outside. So it's, it's, it's something that's objectionable to members in terms of smoking in an eating area. Should smoking be completely prohibited on the entire Foxfire campus? This surprised us because these are non-smokers and the ones that said, no, they don't feel that it should be completely restricted. What they're saying is to us, this was our analysis. We have respect for our members who smoke. We realize that it is part of who they are and what they do. And we wanna be able to give them some accommodation because we respect their right to do that. Um, that was our interpretation of this. And then smoke, this is the same question that was asked of the smokers. 
smoking should be allowed in these designated areas. And the non-smokers, again, a large majority of them said the golf course should be an area where smoking is allowed. Um, we then went into the verbatims and those were very telling. Um, and we're not gonna go through all of these obviously, but I did an analysis, oops, I did an analysis of, um, of the different categories that members were responding to. And I sort of put together the ones that responded, you know, no smoking anywhere on campus or specific areas they felt there should not be smoking, no smoking in dining areas, no smoking because of health concerns. Um, that was, that was a, there were a lot of really thoughtful remarks in that regard. We are a senior community of sorts and many people do have health issues and we need to be very sensitive to that. And there were six people that said no cigars at all. Um, so you can see that, you know, the, the no smoke, you know, limited or no smoking was the largest verbatim types that we received. Uh, smoking should be allowed on the golf course only. Nine people commented on that. Smoking in designated outdoor areas, parking lot, et cetera. 52 people make comments on that. Uh, smoking allowed at Foxfire without restriction. Uh, five people thought we should not restrict smoking at all anywhere at Foxfire. And that's, you know, that's a minority in, in terms of the other remarks. And uh, vaping should be allowed. And there were some remarks in terms of why. Um, the other two areas that um, were, were surprising were members that talked about discrimination against smokers, smokers' rights and interests and personal choice, uh, non-smokers' rights and interests, and smokers you know, bad habits. They talked about smokers' bad habits, disposing of materials, things that they found objectionable. Um, there were some negative comments about the survey, positive comments. And then I thought one comment was interesting that alcohol seems more of a problem than smoking. So it, it really, when you get into our members' heads and hear what they're see, thinking, um, this was very interesting. Um, And I'm going to, so, and maybe Roger can speak to this, but um, after we did our analysis, our committee, um, I asked if, I um, since I'm not there, I asked Roger, Rob Grant, and Melissa Kay to do a um, site survey walk on Wednesday, and uh, Donald provided them with a schematic of what that's going to look like. And I think, Roger, if you can start speaking to this. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to do that. Uh, keep in mind what uh, uh, Christina said, uh, this ad hoc group wanted to respect the views of both smokers and non-smokers, -smoke as well as their family members who may have somebody smoking. So we walked the campus for what's going to be the new area uh, if you will, uh, in 2022. And we said, where, if we were going to establish a designated smoke area, might we find room for our, the smokers within the campus? Um, we have, we feel as Christine has said that our recommendation would be that absolutely you cannot smoke on the patio. We're going to have open windows uh, in 2022. That becomes non-smoking in the future, 2022. But we tried to search out where both our associates and members might be able to smoke on the campus. Uh, and what uh, uh, Christine and, uh, and Melissa uh, had drawn up on this particular schematic are two potential areas that are a little bit further removed from the 
dining uh, outside area, yet it's within the proximity to the campus. Uh, and they're labeled number one and uh, number two. Uh, and we recognize that, that our ad hoc group of associates are not the final, final determinant determiner of uh, whether there is an, a designated area and where it should be. Uh, but we're encouraging the House Committee, the uh, Construction Committee, uh, and the uh, Strategic Planning Committee to take into consideration these particular areas. Um, and we're, we're doing it now because the board had encouraged us uh, at, last, at the last board meeting, get the survey taking place, let's have it. We have to have information uh, and thoughts if we're gonna go through our construction committee uh, sourcing. Uh, one of the topics that we talked about is, uh, and I only use it as an example at this point, uh, don't have one fire pit, have two fire pits. Uh, perhaps you can run a line uh, out to a second fire pit, either area one or two, and designate that as a designated smoking area. Our smokers, who are our friends uh, and, uh, and neighbors, would have the opportunity to be in close proximity to the new halfway house, uh, to the uh, food opportunity, and they can uh, uh, quickly come up and, uh, and uh, receive that, that food or that beer or whatever it might be, and also have the potential that uh, uh, they would be accommodated uh, in, uh, in the ordering process. Um, the, it, it, obviously, most of the membership is not sitting in uh, uh, Naples right at this particular point in time. But as you look at the area, uh, we think that there is uh, an area that where we've already removed some trees. It's going to be a flat ground, uh, and that's number one. Uh, it's beyond the wall where people are sitting uh, and having an area there, it's, uh, it's a half a chip shot uh, to, uh, to get to the, uh, to the clubhouse to, uh, to get a beer. Uh, number two is uh, at the south uh, end of what the new bocce courts are. If you had a, a fire pit in that particular area, uh, with, a, with a small wall around it, a uh, glass wall. Uh, you've got an opportunity to, uh, to uh, accommodate 12% of our population who are currently smokers. Um, and uh, if other people wanna sit there, uh, they're, they're welcome to, but it's designated as a designated uh, smoking area. So that's, that's what we did. Uh, we're not trying to pass off a decision process because we know it's not our responsibility, but we know it's not our responsibility. It's the House Committee, the Construction Committee, and the Strategic Planning Committee uh, responsibility to make this call, whether we incorporate this into the plans. Uh, we would encourage them to, uh, to consider either Site 1 or Site 2 for outside smoking. The and Roger, I see you have some circled question marks. I assume that those are areas for employees. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know we have some staff and some cart barn guys who yes. are smokers, so we, we need to find a place for them. Yes, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up, Taffy, that we, we put that in there. Uh, we have in this building uh, roughly uh, four, perhaps five people who are smokers, employees. Um, and uh, our, uh, our food and beverage operation has two people in the, uh, I don't think we have anybody in the front of the house that's a smoker, but we do have people in the back of the house. We have a couple that are, that are smokers. And I we, think we do have somebody in the front of the house, but that's okay. They, and, and I think you're right. I think you're right. We do have, I know of one person that we have in the front of the house who, who will take a smoking break. We want to put that away from the food uh, we think that there's enough room in a 
walled area at the exterior of the, uh, the kitchen uh, where a separate table can be set. Uh, now, operations is gonna have to tell us, should we do that? Uh, and is that gonna be an interference in any way, shape or form for, uh, for the employees who are non-smokers? Uh, but it would be separated and the table would be des designated as this is uh, a smoking table, if you so choose. Mm -hmm. yeah, people it's, smoke in that area. Yeah. Other question. The other one is near the new cart barn, the question mark that uh, the Taffy has pointed out. Um, the speaking with Donald, uh, there are uh, quite a number of uh, uh, men. We don't have any uh, female employees that I'm aware of at uh, at this point in the car farm, who are smokers. Um, one option is to say jump in a golf cart when you want to take a cigarette. When you are taking your break, when you are taking your break, go to the end of the driving range and smoke a cigarette there. Um, That's not practical. Um, our concern would be that are we going to chase people away? Is there a convenient way where we could uh, designate a small area outside that cart barn on the uh, on the back end side where we could say there is a smoking table here should you need it because I just want to point out one thing that that question mark by the cart barn is right below the balcony to the fitness center. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they're going to want that there. Kathy, that's because that's the way we had to draw it. Uh, okay. The, the cart barn is, as you recall, is going to move, move a, a bit further away uh, from uh, the existing uh, uh, verandas, and there will be space behind it if we so choose. Okay. Yeah, that, that spot right there is not recommended, I wouldn't think. Not, if there are open windows above it to the fitness area, that's probably not the best spot. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Mark. I have a question. A, I yeah. do smoke cigars. My wife smokes. Uh, is there a place that's out of the weather, you know, and where they have cocktail service, where one of our uh, servers will come out and serve us? Because we, we sit outside 99% of the time. Right. And we are very considerate of other people. Uh, however, we do like the convenience of not having to run in and get our own drinks. I want to sit there and if I want appetizers, if I want meals or whatever, we enjoy our dinner outside, but it's got to be out of the weather. I'm not going to sit outside. I won't come to the place anymore if that's the case. You know, it, that's ridiculous. It's got to be protected from the weather. And that includes the summer heat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just the winter because we sit outside with the heaters on in the winter time with a jacket on and have dinner. Right. And I have no problem with that. Right. Uh, the summertime, same type of thing with the fans out there and it's protected. It's out of the sun. And uh, we sit outside 90, I'm going to say 99% of the time. And it's part of our dining experience. So there's got to be something out of the weather completely. Yeah. It, and I, I, uh, I hear you on that, Mark, uh, and what we try to uh, say is let's find, I, I don't know how the tables are going to be set up outside at this particular point in time. Uh, I hope it's uh, a lovely table and uh, we've got a, a, an umbrella that's over the top of it. We thought area one and an area two could be those areas in close proximity to the clubhouse to get a beverage uh, and to also uh, uh, have a, uh, have a bite to eat if that's uh, that's what uh, what you're looking for. Well, I think this is something we can take the, to the construction committee and and tell them the concerns there that we do need protection from heat and rain there's, and to consider this. There's no question about it, but the. In the schematic you can that's adjacent to the halfway house, you can see a set of uh, tables. Now that area is going to be paved. Those, those are going to be ongoing dining tables. 
Uh, there would be no smoking there because people are going to eat and they are outside the clubhouse itself. They are outside the clubhouse itself. But if you put umbrellas in the center of the table, if we buy the right uh, furniture, you will have, uh, have coverage for the people that are non-smokers and you can do the same thing in areas one and areas two. Well, umbrellas are nice, but they don't stop the rain and they don't stop the sun from coming down once it starts to set. It's very hot. You know, so there's got to be some protected area. Of, uh, the way it is now, Florida law says you can have a temporary roof over your head and allow smoking out there. Um, the way it is now, that's the way you get away with it. It's smoking on the patio is because it's a temporary roof. Uh, if it's a structural roof, it's another animal. So something has to be considered there for all smokers, not just myself. You're asking this ad hoc group of ours um, something that we can't answer. Uh, and that, that would have to go to the construction committee. But I will say that the windows in the grill room are going to open up and they're all of us felt there should not be smoking in, on any of the pat, the existing patio area. That's the only thing that's covered. We are not planning on building an extensive roof out over the uh, area. The other thing is, is how often are those windows ever gonna be opened because of the flies and bugs and everything else and the air conditioning increase? Um, those windows, I would vir virtually say will probably almost never be open. Well, we do. Uh, we are planning to have them opened. Um, there's a, I forget what the thing is called, but it's a, a, a air stream that protects the uh, air and bugs from going in and out. Yeah. Uh, but the heat and humidity and everything else, you're going to kill the inside. And people don't want the heat and humidity. That's why they go into the air conditioning. There are, there are many restaurants in, in Naples that have a similar setup with open windows. Um, I can think at Bayfront of, of a few, um, they do it very effectively. Again, this would be something for the construction committee to consider. Um, and it will certainly, uh, I'm sure Tappy will have this conversation now that we've presented this. The other thing we also talked about you know, Mark, you mentioned having a server um, and we would have to con consult with operations, but in these designated smoking areas, if, if operations could manage it to have, even though the outside casual dining is a self-serve situation, but because of the nature of the designated smoking areas, we could also ask operations if there's a way to designate servers to take care of those areas. So I think those there are options available to us. This is just the very beginning of the discussion, but I think we did get very valuable feedback. Again, we don't want, we're, we're, we're not saying this is the way it's gonna be, but I think that we're, we're presenting some very viable options. We're presenting very viable feedback and information from our members. And we, we do have to remember that we're going to, we are, we respectfully do want to accommodate the smokers because they're a valuable part of our community. Um, I, you know, someone somewhere said, you know, smokers are not evil. They're not the bad guys. Um, and we never viewed it that way when we were working through this survey. But on the other side of that, it is a minority of our community. And we have to also consider our other members, what they said on this survey, which they don't wanna be in a smoking, they don't wanna be subjected to smoke while they're eating. So we're, we're trying to make accommodations for both sides of the argument. Well, Christine, I, I, I appreciate what you and your group have done uh, so far. And I think it needs to go to the next step uh, uh, to the House Committee and the Construction Committee uh, to further discuss it and uh, uh, come back to the board with some recommendations. 
Right. Are there okay. any other Roger, questions? you're going to take it to house and I'll take it to construction. Okay. And, and Christine, I, I'm fairly certain that we can get, we can break down. <laughs> Uh, I, I hear Mark's concern and other smokers will have this concern about wet weather um, uh, situations. Um, we'll want to find out how many months the average uh, smoker spends here um, and break that down so the House Committee and the Construction Committee can, uh, can take a look at it. Um, yeah, we can break, I think we can break that down out of this um, survey. If, if, if there's, the construction committee is going to have to ask themselves, should we build a covered area for uh, the smoker? Uh, and the smokers really are only, if the majority of the smokers are here uh, three to four <laughs> months a year, those are months that it's not raining at all. Uh, it's, it's the season. And uh, uh, they have that opportunity to be out in the invigorating outside that, uh, that everybody, all of us relish as people who live in, uh, in Southwest Florida. Roger, if, if the same person, the same member went downtown, would they have the option of smoking under an enclosure? That's what I'm, I'm keep wondering. Because not if it's near food. <laughs> not if it's near food. That's 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 my point. I mean, I I know what we're trying to do, and I appreciate that. Right. But I'm I keep thinking that the same member went downtown Naples. I can't think of any restaurant down there that provides an overhead coverage right. and a dining option. Right. And, and I, where's that? But we're we're kind of salt. talking apples and oranges here. I mean, oh. we're talking about our members. You know, if you go downtown, you have the option of choosing your restaurant. You know, here everybody's a member, so it's kind of not a fair comparison. Well, I think we have to be careful about we have to comply with the Florida Clean Indoor Act regarding smoking in areas that have that are enclosed, even if it's partially enclosed. There are laws that govern that, so we have to be very careful about that. Well, I'm I'm um, I'm an occasional cigar smoker. I never smoke outside of my own house, though. I never bring it to the club, but I do enjoy having a cigar. But I will say this. <coughs> if we set up a situation where we have a smoking area on or near the patio such that people who are dining or having drinks on the patio uh, are exposed to smoke, I personally think there's going to be hell to pay. I think the members are going to, some of the members are going to get very angry at that. And I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I'm saying I think others will. And I just want to be very careful that we keep, if we're doing a smoking area, that it be kept away from that patio area so that people uh, don't, don't protest and revolt. And Jim, if you read through the verbatims carefully, the, um, you know, the, uh, where is that? Sorry. Um, here we go. Well, I'm not sure where it's at now. I'm not, I'm not Kathy um, O'Brien, you know, um, but anyway, um, if we, if we look at that one, um, oh, here, this Excel spreadsheet, if, if we look at this and we look at the percentage of people that said no smoking, you know, no smoking in these areas, this is what the majority, 88% of the members were telling us. And the last time I checked, majority rules, but this is a community and we do want to accommodate the smokers in some way, shape or form. The board has the authority to change designated smoking areas. We're not eliminating any designated smoking areas. What we're attempting to do is to accommodate our smokers to give them a comfortable dining experience without imposing on the comfort of the other members who do not want to be exposed to the smoke. Christine, so, you may have understood me. I didn't, I'm not advocating for eliminating the smoking area. All I wanted to do is make sure that it stays away from the patio area. No, right. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I just, I just wanted to make that point though, that, um, 
we are making every effort to find an accommodation for the smokers that'll give them a good experience when they come to the clubhouse. We don't know what that is. Um, Roger, Rob, and Melissa did walk the campus um, and, they, and they put me on FaceTime for a while and it was inter interesting for me to see the progress that's been made and to see the space. Once you're in the space, you feel differently about it than just looking at you know, the schematic that we had. But I, I do want to assure the smokers that you know we're our our goal was never to find a way to eliminate any place for them to smoke in the dining area. Our goal was to find a place, accommodate them, and give them as enriching an experience as possible without imposing on the other members with smoke. Um, it's well documented secondhand smoke is a health risk that's not a surprise you know we've been well educated on that so all these things you know in combination is is where we're trying to get to with this the smoking we just did the analysis this week we uh you know it's it's sort of new to us also and we did our best to come up with the recommendations that we did come up with which i have provided to everyone um and Tappy and Roger, you will move this forward and bring this to the construction and house committees, as I understand that will be the next steps. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Uh, my only question is um, at the moment, this is a uh, recommendation of the smoking ad hoc committee. And uh, my question is, do we want to endorse, does, do we as a board want to endorse your conclusions? Um, I, I, I think we're, it's too preliminary now. I think, I think it's too preliminary. Um, I, I'd love to be at that point, but okay. I, again, this was just done this week. I think if we could pass this around, start getting comments back, I would like to be involved in some of this process, I, I, if, if possible, uh, when this is discussed at construction and house. I know Roger will be there. But because you know, I worked so closely and intimately with all these questions and with the structure, I'd at least like to be a you know, silent observer of what um, the two committees are thinking um, in, in this regard. And I think the important thing to remember here, there's no point in doing a survey if we do not make it actionable and enforceable. It is a data-driven survey we could have drilled down a lot more. We wanted to keep it as simple as possible, not to overburden people. But I do appreciate all the members that gave verbatims because that was a very, very telling. Um, it, it, you know, reading their words um, that were so heartfelt, some of them. So it is a data-driven survey. It gave us good, good information. We are very cognizant that we want to respect all our members rights whether they're smokers or non-smokers and we want to come up with the best viable solution that complies with the florida statutes and with our own bylaws so that's that's where we're coming from that's the way we approach this um, we had no agenda outside of that we were very open-minded again our committee consisted of all different kinds of smokers, non-smokers, you know, as I mentioned earlier. So that I, I, I don't think we're ready as a board to approve any of this. I think it has to go to another next step of the House and Construction Committee, and then we can come back with what their thoughts are on this and make some final recommendations before we vote on it. Okay. Uh where I think it, you know, we need to leave it at this point. I agree. So uh, thank you, Christine. My pleasure. And then thank you to your committee as well. We appreciate the effort you put into this. Uh, next on the agenda is the uh, transfer, transfer form and process, Ray. Okay. Um, we continue to work on this. I think I mentioned that I acquired a an excellent partner in, in this, in Jim, Jim Moore, um, because we saved some preliminary legal fees. 
they gained a lot of knowledge. Um, the form, I'm gonna go over it this way. Um, and the third page is gonna change slightly. So I'm just gonna put that in front of me. Let's not worry about that right now. Let me just explain, explain it this way. Here's where we're at. We have, a, this is actually the third redraft of, of all the work. And it, it's simple if you think of the, this form as a three page document, each page providing a different uh, value. Uh, page one, so everybody remembers, is a composite of not only our, our transfer form as a master, but of uh, three other sub communities, Brandis one, Brandis two, Fox Hollow, and actually countryside. So we, we combine in page one, the information we think is necessary as a quick review of who's coming in. Okay. Uh, and that's probably gonna change a little bit because uh, I'm, Linda's here taking the notes, but Linda and Stella and I have talked and they've made a couple little tweaks, nothing that it matters to us as a board, maybe just change a word here or there, but it makes it better. And that's what we want to do. I, I want to make sure I say this now, in all of this process, the president's council sees the documentation because they're going to become a very viable and important part of this. So they will see everything that goes through here and their comments and suggestions, which by the way, have been very complimentary. I haven't really gotten uh, many negative comments from any of the president's council respondees, but they will be put in here. The important page is number two, because it's going to bring us to the next part of this discussion. And you'll notice on page number two, it starts, that's what starts off as used in this document. It, it defines a, a, a full rights and a social rank. That's something that has not been clearly defined in previous transfer forms. We've talked about that, the way our covenants read. It now is there. And very simply, a full right member relinquishes everything. Social right, they relinquish everything but the golf course. And let me just give you a little thought into that thinking. We could have said not the driving range and not this. And then we realized it would have been a difficult thing to police. So we really want to finite this thing so, so succinctly that it's hard to manage. So Jim's next to me, as we say this, we both agree that let's just say full rights is golf course and everything. Social rights is everything but the golf course. I think that's fair because it's gonna bring us to the next level. And in fact, I'm gonna give you the recommended change that came in after Jim, we did this. You know about this. Finance looked at the recommended rates that we wanna charge for transfer. Previously, if you recall, it was $260 uh, for a, a full rights transfer, $55 for a social transfer, and the annual tenant paid $125 for their transfer if it was full and $55 if it was social. Uh, Lynn Anderson wrote to the golf committee because they started that this progression and to me, and I responded to Lynn and I, and she, and I agree with her statement that the finance committee came up with, which is, Let's make it simple. Forget the 260, 400, 500. We're going to make it, we're going to suggest that it be $400 for a full rights transfer and that the social transfer be elevated to 50% of the full rights at $200. Two rates, $400, $200. I'm looking at, right, I've got that, that Donald and I spoke about it, Roger and I, we know about it, Jim. So that's the easy way to do this. Let me just give you the, net, the relative effect of that new change versus what you're seeing on paper. It's about $8,000 a year, it's minimal. Because there are, remember, not everybody who rents here rents for three months. So we're elevating the 260 to 400, we're reducing the 500 potential back to 400. It may be $8,000 over the year based upon last year's, uh, or this current year's uh, uh, tenant population. That would be a change to what you saw last month. And then I go on to page number three. Roger, flip that to you because there's three there. You can split them this way. I apologize, Christine and Mark and, and Tappy because it came up last night, but I'm just going to tell you where the change is at the bottom of the page. It's very minor. But what we have done in this form is now have a member sign off, acknowledging that they know what their obligations are and responsibilities are and a tenant sign off again for their responsibilities 
And that's in that first paragraph in the top of the page. We have realtors involved and we wanna tie the realtors into their responsibility. And that's that next section you see, because if they bring someone into our community and say, we want them to be a, a tenant, we want the realtor to know what their, we want them to know what their responsibility is. And quite frankly, we wanna make sure they're aware that if they don't play the game correctly, they may not have that opportunity in the future. Finally, on the bottom of the form, this is where the small change comes in. If you follow with me, uh, for Tappy and Christine and, and Mark, uh, into the second sentence, the tenant for the term set forth ab above uh, are approved, not confirmed. I think you have confirmed on what you're looking at. You make sure that's correct. Yes. yes. Okay. And then it, the sentence continues and there's one fur further sentence after neighborhood association. And I'll say it slowly. Note, this agreement and transfer of privileges are not valid unless both approvals are signed below. She added that a little later. It's a good idea. Maybe the master association and the neighborhood association. Got it. If they're not both signed off on this form, so that just ties up the matter. Now, is this the final legal document? No, because we need to have a Florida attorney review it. But we think we're- So giving... who signs that exactly? I mean, I, Master Association, I guess, you know, Stella or Linda could sign it, but sure. Neighborhood Association, that would just be the Neighborhood Association president or any officer Maybe. or who? Or they, I, I would think that yeah, they could do that, or it could be turned over to the um, to the uh, management company, Newell or Resorts, uh, and designated that they're signing on behalf of the of the sub. I think we've encouraged the presidents of each of the associations to become involved in this process, and it would be up to each association to decide who can sign on their behalf. If the president's in town, that person obviously could. Any officer could. Yeah. And if president and officers are gone, they'll have to designate someone who can sign on their behalf. Right. That's who's down here. And there's, there's, there's no you realtor. Have to, you have to be you have to be physically present to sign this. Why couldn't you sign it and scan it and send it back to, to yeah. Fox? Sure. That'd be fine. Yeah. We can I, I can go into the process in just a second. But the importance is that we needed a, a good starting point. And we have an excellent starting point right now. Ray, I, I sure. would suggest that uh, um, the master association be the last to approve this. That is correct. So that those yep. and, master and, things should be flipped. And Bill, let me um, let me just tell you what um, what I've heard from various sources uh, at the subs and internally and from from administration. Uh, if you follow the progression, the member would start with the form. They could get it from the office or we would put it on the website, okay? They would give it to the tenant who would complete their important information and give it back to the member because the member is the one who's, who's um, making this happen. And they're, they're the seller in this case. At that point, the member would give it to, and this would be up to their sub-association. They could give it to their sub-association or go directly to Newell or to um, resort mm -hmm. or member single family homes has no sub involvement here or they can bring it right into the office but a completed form to that point properly signed would then go to management right. be it management foxfire management for the sub and then it goes ultimately gets back to the master association mm -hmm. office at that point we have everything it's probably about a 21 day process we should say to the members don't do this the last minute. You should do it really 30 days out. Okay. That ties everybody up uh, contractually. Time limits, we have our information. Um, there's a couple questionable areas that we, can, we, we need to look at. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to think ahead when this would start because on our website, we do list a, a series of charges, the, the previous charges um, indicating transfer fee of 260 and social and 55. 
But I've understood in the past that we've done that. We've just said, hey, it's been updated. Here's the new thing. It would go to basically go into effect October 1. I, I, that's what we thought. Yeah, the new fiscal year. Yeah, that's what I thought, Don. October 1. Okay. Um, a couple of suggestions on the, the uh, transfer fees. You might want to put in there payable to and uh, specify who the, the money is payable to. And also at the bottom, you might want to uh, put uh, this completed form should be returned, unless it's in there that I missed, should be returned to the Fox Fire Administrative Office. Um, I, in regard to the second tapping, I think when we make the announcement to the members, we would put that into the announcement and say, here's what's happening. And perhaps on the website, we could put that as a bold when completed return to. I agree. As to the yeah. Well, this is a suggestion just for people to think about, Don, it's really your, your decision. But we may not have to go through a check process, give me a check. We, we may say we'll just charge the member's account. We could think about that and say, do we want to have the member responsible for the payment as opposed to having a check come with the form? I don't really don't care, but whatever you think about it. Right, right. Okay. I'll tell you that Countryside uses that procedure. Mm -hmm. The member is charged. What's interesting about all of this is this is a nice form, but having rented units in, in Naples prior, not here, but in other places, I had a contract. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if this is the only thing that's going to be transacted with between the member and the tenant, or whether there's going to be a supporting contract. I would have a There should be a lease. There should be a lease, I would think. So I just, it's just a thought. Anyway, Having said that, uh, let me just look at a couple of things. What will still happen down the road and what we have to think about is what happens if people do not follow the procedure. Our procedure does say per our documents that you can not rent for less than 30 days. I can assure you I see people running around in, 30, in 15 day and seven day rentals because I'm over in Foxhorn, I see it. So when I visit my mother, I see these people in a building for seven days and they're out. This is going to tighten that process up significantly. And that means that we also have to remember that there will be a need for a fine or a suspension policy that supports this action. That is in our documents. But as to what those, those values will be and how it's structured, I'm not worried about it today. I'm more worried about getting the work in, knowing that we have to get that decided over the next two months. Is that fair? Ray, what, what is your feeling about the president's council members? Do they want everybody that's in one of their buildings that, that's being leased to complete this type of form? We, when we first started talking about this, one of the things that we all said is the associations themselves want to know who the heck is in their building. Okay. So, so they have to be able to enforce. Are they behind enforcing get this filled if you're going to have somebody in? I, I put it to you this way, Roger. There's 17 associations, I guess. Right. I would say 14 of them to 15 of them are behind this. A couple are maybe not as much. But then again, they really don't care if they're in the president's council. So right. it, it, it's, that's probably the reason. They do want to enforce it. And their problem has been the uh, the need for a good reporting. So when this all happens and it comes into here, that monthly report that we were able to give them at the end of this rental season in March, they loved it because they said, oh my God, there's big discrepancies. Not only in what they knew, but what their management company knew. So that's going to tighten up significantly. And I've gotten some very favorable remarks from these presidents saying, boy, we want to do this. And by the way, it's an so aside. It. As an aside, just so you know, we've talked about the president's council and the fact that it's been somewhat dormant. I've seen comments going back and forth now through me on other matters. So the participation is getting better, not only in this, but in other matters. And that's good. So they want to see this. Okay. But if, remember when I said there's another part to this, um, I'll say it now. There's also the potential or possibility that some of these people may be fined 
I'll say, as far as I'm concerned, that fine money should go right back to the sub association. You want an inducement? You want to stop it? You go out, you become the detective to protect their communities, their sub communities. They should also get the benefit of that fine money that comes in. That's the that's what that, and that's one of the things we have to talk about with Steve because, well, you, among other things, sure. Maybe, but just in general, those, uh, those the individual associations I've, um, and, the, and condo associations, for them to for them to charge a fine, they actually there's a there's a process. We're not talking about them charging. I understand that. Okay, I understand that. <laughs> I'm saying, but there's a process, and I don't know. Are we talking about the master charging a fine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's statutory rules. Yeah, we have the authority to impose fines. Yeah, I know, but I guess my question is, if we're if we're, why would we charge a fine if the sub association is not doing their part to enforce their rules? No, why would no? Donald, see, they want to enforce the rules, but their their bar to that has been they don't know who. They don't, they're not fully aware of if someone's in that building and they should be there. Once they know that, they want to enforce it. Right, right. I, 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 I'm just gonna say, but what I'm saying right now is like today, my belief is that any one of those associations, because I agree with this whole process, I say, but I think any one of those associations today has a right to um, go to any one of their homeowners or condo owners who is, renting without documentation and start a process to find them. I think they all have that right without any of this happening. Okay. And, and that's what I'm saying. They, so if they, if they want to um, enforce what the policy is in their documents, they already have the right to do that. And I'm not saying that we don't, I, cause I like this whole process because I think that it will tie things together. But um, what I'm saying is right now they have the authority to attend to those things. I just don't believe that all this time the management companies have been applying those. Well, no, we have the same rules as a right. master right. association. Right. That's all I'm concerned right. about right. as a master right. association. Right. And if we have rules that say you cannot rent for less than three right. days, then right. we probably ought to enforce those right. rules or right. just get rid of them. Right. Um, and so that's, if the local associations, neighborhoods want to enforce different rules, that's up to them. Right. But I'm, all I'm looking at is from our point. And, and, I, and, I, and I totally agree, but what was, I guess the thing is, is for us, we see we don't transfer, like we when, when we transfer up, up to a transfer, the transfers that we do are, are always basically 30, 60, 90 days. Mm -hmm. If someone comes in and does a transfer for 14 days, it's not like we're gonna turn around and like Roger rents his house for 14 days, they come back in on the 17th day, do we transfer that membership again? That would be something for us if we, that's well, not really happening on our on our end, but it's happening um, individually. Mm -hmm. And so I agree with the whole idea of tying this whole concept together. But we're not we're not should I say um, uh, overlooking the fact that when we get a transfer form, they're going to be thirty days or more. But that's the same. Doesn't the same rule apply to the sub association? Well, the because they can't be less restrictive. Than exactly, well, they, they 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 can be more restrictive. And I and I want to say, for example, like villas too. I think that there is is ninety days. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, I, I I just want to, from the standpoint that I think that the, the authority for from both the master and all the condo associations is there to enforce whatever it might be. The, the the only conflict that I see is it when it comes to the fining, when it comes to actually fining. If they're violating the association, the sub associations policy, and not our policy, how would we have the authority? No, we wouldn't. That? No, I think, what I, that I, I think I think Donald, the, the point is with the statutory rules, it would be someone who is uh, renting a unit mm -hmm. less than thirty days, that would go to statutory rules. Mm -hmm. If there's other things in there that might be four or five people in a unit. I don't think that that, okay, yeah, you, okay. you know what I'm saying? I, I okay. I, I, Having said that, and I, I left one thing out I should have said earlier. During this process, when this form is, is being passed around, the rules for the sub association will get to the tenant. We'll mm -hmm. make sure that's that's there. 
Right. Because it's in this document that they have seen it. So right. therefore, because each sub has different rules, we can't incorporate it into here. Sure. So what it will become is an attachment to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. As for the master rules. Yeah, we that's, have ours that we that's right. right. Got it. Okay. Sure. I, I didn't say that. Uh, my concern, know. my concern was more about the fining. I, that's where I was saying, you know, it's I just think if the money comes in and we get it in here, it appropriately should go back to the people who've searched out the issue. And that issue is going to be searched out by the by the local sub. That's my point. Okay. I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but uh, we can work that out down the road. I mean, if we're taking in a fine and then we're paying it to the sub association, I think we need some sort of agreement between them. I mean, uh, I'm not sure. Jim, you probably have a better idea of that. But it just sounds a little, Actually, a little funny to me. Actually, it's uh, it is the sub association's responsibility to do set up the fine and the fine committee because it's breaking their rules. Okay, we can stop them from fourteen day accessibility to the master amenities, but the sub association takes care of all the fining as far as that goes in all the communities I've ever dealt with. They set up their own fining committee. It's come from the board to be assessed if they're going to be fined. And then they have a 14 day notice sent out to the finding committee. The finding committee has a meeting, sort of like an appellate court. And then the tenant can do whatever he wants to do or present his case. And then the finding committee will either thumbs up to the board's original fine or thumbs down to the board original fine. There's no, they can't adjust it. It's either yes, they're in favor of the fine or no, they're not. And then they can be fined. But it's, always, it's always the sub association. It's not the master. We have a different procedure written into our covenants and bylaws, and I don't know how that interacts with whatever the sub associations have. But we have a procedure outlined in our documents that says the rules committee must investigate. The rules committee makes a recommendation to the board. The board makes the final decision on fines or suspensions. If the person aggrieved wants an appeal, they may have one in front of the statutory rules committee and the decision of the statutory rules committee is either to affirm or deny what the board decided. That's how it's written in our bylaws and charters. Right, right. And I just think that with, with, with the neighborhood association, I, I believe it's a statutory requirement that they, if they are gonna impose fines, the individual association, they, uh, they have to have their own fining committee. So that's sort of, okay. No, that's, that's fine. That's, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a different. Yeah, that's, right. We're talking, that's correct, Donald. And that and that may be that we decide to turn it over to them right. if they have that authority. If they're going to use it, uh, the other, you know, they may sit on their hands, and we may not like that. We may want to do it ourselves. And from from our standpoint, the way the, the, the process that's laid out here, from our standpoint, is that ultimately. It's just like when someone comes in with an incomplete transfer form, we don't we don't transfer the member. Right. So until so until we have this that's completed and signed off on, only then would we transfer. So if we see something that's not right, we wouldn't we wouldn't transfer the membership. So if I can do this, uh, it appears that we're in agreement that the form as as we're suggesting it in its in its layout is good. Mm -hmm. I would like to have the board acknowledge that we will send this on to Steve Falk. I will uh, mention to the board that there might be slight changes to the first page, which are not legal. They're really just uh, utilitarian. And I'll, I'll get with Stella and Linda who, who are gonna do a little bit of review for me. I will make sure that the third page that as, even though I read it to the people in Tappy and Christine, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, get, I'll get this in your, in your bin so you get to see it as a replacement. Right. We'll shoot this as a target to get the, the form ready. Uh, and my, my last thought would be, we might want to bring a note up to the statutory rules committee or rules committee, whichever it is. And I think we should say to them, here's what we're in the process of doing regarding the fines. Can you give us your, your opinions? That, well, well it's, it'll, be the, it'll be the rules committee and it will go to Chris Jackson. I don't think, I mean, I'll just send him the form okay. and say, just by the way, this is what's coming down the road and he'll be fine. Okay, okay. We'll uh, and by the way, before this goes to 
Steve Falk, I want to be able to sign off on what goes to him because I have a little bit of a stake in, in my No, no, I, I, I use this. So we'll, we'll get, we got a few tweaks to make. Give me a couple days. I'm sure by next Thursday's meeting, I'll have it physically and I'll just give it to you. Okay. Okay, cool. Good. If I could just make a yep. couple of comments here. Um, I don't understand why we have age on this. I think that's discriminatory oh. and I don't see the purpose. That's one of the tweaks that's going to be made. That's coming off. And also, um, I think that you know, where it says contact phone number I, um, for the tenant and the, the spouse should also provide their contact cell phone number and their email. But that's being changed also. That was yeah, the I mean, I heard Linda talking about it, but I did want to affirm that because- uh, the email, email requirements for both the tenant and the spouse. It's really important because um, you know, we painstakingly collected emails when we were doing the smoking survey. We have to have a process, and I, Linda and Stella are being really good about now having a process for that. So we collect everyone's contact phone numbers and emails. It, it, moving forward, like Dr. Cornetta was saying about how we're going to utilize the website, you know, garbage in is garbage out. We have to create, provide accurate information. I'm just wondering what the purpose of occupation and employer on here. Um, is there is there a specific purpose for that question? They appeared on the applications of both Verandas 1 and Verandas 2. So I tried to combine as best I could their documents to make it more, an easier transition. I have no problem with taking it out. It doesn't matter to me. I, I just didn't know what the purpose of it was, you know, you know. It came from the previous forms. It's just a way of, if we have trouble tracking people down in the future, it's helpful to have their employer. Yeah, that was my feeling. It's just another sort of fail safe device to make sure that they're sure. legit. And, yeah. and, but the omen of responsibility for leasing one's unit falls on the, the owner member. Right. And, the reason this started coming to a head was because of ten members that were leasing to tenants that were causing issues at Foxfire. Is that part of the reason? Would I be correct when I say that? Probably part of it. The, other, the bigger issue is the fact that we have people in there that we don't know that, that are there. That's the primary, but yeah, I'm sure that's part of it. Yeah, well, how do we not know they're there if they go to the office to get it to get their the 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 rights transferred? How do no, we they, not? They don't no. always do that. The, the issue primarily isn't. Is, I would I, my the, the issue primarily isn't with the people that transfer privileges. It's mainly with people who don't. Yeah. Yeah, we got a bunch of VRBO and uh, Airbnb rentals here for a weekend or for a week, and we just don't even know they're coming and going. We have so Have we identified those ten uh, those owner members that do that? We have can't confronted them right, because the association isn't properly identifying that pe that person. Yeah, well, we we have had, uh, according to my conversations with Chris Jackson, he has found uh, evidence of some short-term rentals and he has contacted the owner and told the owner that is not permitted. And the owner has apologized and said they were not aware of the rule and has promised to correct it. Now, Chris does this kind of on his own. He checks VRBO and uh, Airbnb and places like that. And, uh, and so we, we have, run across a few instances of that and have not taken it any further than a warning. Okay, and Donald, when, when um, tenants come in with forms, what, what problems do Linda and Stella have in determining, making the determination whether they could transfer or not transfer, if they're coming in with a signed transfer form. I mean, what issues are you having internally in the office with this whole process? The, the, only, the only issue, I mean, basically, when, when the, the, it's, it's whether or not the transfer form is fully executed. That's the only, because it, there's not a decision for them, for any one of us to make, because basically the owner is, is saying, I'm transferring my privileges to X, 
for this period of time. And as long as as long as that's fully executed, and of course the check clears, then it's okay. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> no. But but that that's really that's so that there's not a decision for us to make as long as that transfer form is fully executed. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I, I've been in the office at the beginning of the month when Stella and Linda are just overwhelmed with tenants coming in one after the other and, you know, they're trying to get all this done. So the easier we could make it for them to make this happen would be one of my goals. Um, I have another question. It was my understanding, and I could be wrong, um, that that we have the that you can only uh, rent or lease your unit three times in a calendar year. So whether you lease it to someone for two weeks, that counts as one lease and the transfers cannot happen more than three times a year. Is that correct or not? That may be in Fox Hollows or the, some of the sub associations, but that is not in the master association. So you could, in the master, you could actually have 12 12 leases. Okay. Just a 30 day minimum lease. But some, as I said, some of the sub associations do have um, rule, uh, rules that are more restrictive than ours, and, they, and they're allowed to do that. It can't, can't be less than 30 days per se. Right. That's, that's the, that starts, that's, that's the master. That's rule number one. That's the master. Right. And if it is a seven, and if it is a 14 day, you know, if it's someone, someone's renting or someone for 14 days, that then their next transfer should, should not be until a month has expired. Right, right. Because you do it on a monthly basis. It's from the beginning to the end of the month. So the hole in uh, our defenses is uh, a situation where, let's say I rent uh, a veranda in Fox Hollow for two weeks and I don't care about Foxfire at all. I'm renting it so I can go to the beach or you know take my kids to the Everglades. Uh, we don't even know that they're here. Mm -hmm. And this is where you know the sub associations uh, need to, to somehow develop some monitoring situation. Right. Right. Uh, so that they, they identify the fact as, as Ray has said that you know you see these groups coming and going on a regular basis. And if they're attached to one unit, you know, somebody in that sub association has to take action. Um, right. under their right. rules That's right. because the master never gets involved in that situation. I, ideally, if you give a 30, if you say you need the, the, the paper trail to start 30 days in advance, it eliminates some of, hopefully eliminates that big issue of people coming in one day before the rental and say, like, here I am. Yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the first part. The last part of it is the end of the train is that after that month, if, when that, before that month starts, we would then have a data sheet of all the renters that would be applicable for that month. Mm -hmm. That is sent by sub association to each one of the presidents. And they now can say, okay, first of the month, 208 is going to have this person, new person. All of a sudden they look and at 208 or 207, there is a person in there that's not on their list. Mm -hmm. They can simply knock on the door and say, hey, yeah. nice to see you. Who are you? Right. Oh, I'm renting here. Uh, not by my list. Did we miss something? And that's that's what we have not been able to yeah. do. And that's how we need to help the subs so they can help us. They, yeah, they can force on. I, I think it'll also help if we establish a policy and make it clear to owners that this is not going to be tolerated anymore. And mm -hmm. you just simply have to abide by the rules. And if you don't, you may get a warning, or the next time you may have your privileges suspended mm -hmm. or fined. Right. And if that if, if they begin to believe that that can actually happen, I think. That will be self enforcing to a certain right. extent. Now, this, this won't completely eliminate people flying under the radar, but I think it'll make it more difficult for them to do it, or at least make them aware that we, we're on to them. And if we catch them, uh, there could be consequences. It's the fair so, way to do it. So, we have, we have personally let former employees, uh, my in law's caregiver, use our unit. Um, which they, which they were not using any Foxfire um, facility, I mean, you know, amenities. Um, I, I mean, I feel that I, I certainly have a right to let other people that I know, family use my unit, 
how does this affect that? Probably not. It's uh, not a. No, it's, it's not a lease arrangement. So. No, there's. It's in here. Oh. Yeah, that, what, you're, what you're saying is not uncommon. That's 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 right. That's quite common. Is that you're, you're letting them use it, but you're not renting to them. Right. Right. It's a different situation, right? And they're not here to play golf. And they're, in theory, uh, not here to use the fitness center because they don't have uh, uh, access to it. Uh, now, if, it, if it's your son or your daughter coming down, right. then, they, then they can, they're a green card. And they're they're like, a green card. Right. Well, and, and, and again, in full disclosure, I'll be very honest with you. You know, I have relationships with other owners that when they're not using their unit and if my family wants to come down, they'll let us use their unit. Obviously, my family is on a green card, and I make sure and it's usually within Fox Hollow anyway. But uh, you know, I make sure that everyone around there knows who who's coming in. Well, by now they know them all. But um, I mean, I mean, I have, and I'm just being really honest here. You know, uh, and, and last year in particular, you know, when two of our families got stuck down here because their flights kept getting canceled, you know, Donald and I were able to work through that and get them, you know, um, numbers and, you know, cause they, they couldn't, I, you know, I don't know how long a green card is good for it, but nonetheless, that goes last year. But I mean, I do have arrangements with that, with, with member, uh, with owners that I know at, at Fox Hollow and, and to use their units when they're not using them, if my family is going to be here. And then that's an accommodation that they do for us because we know each other and we're friends. Christine, I think we found a paragraph that we're looking for. I think it's 3.26. I've shown it to Jim. He's, it's in the um, covenants and conditions restrictions. It's um, page 1111, uh, page 1110 at the bottom. And uh, it, it, it goes into the process. Uh, I believe I'm going to read somewhere in here where it says they have to notify somebody. Uh, Failure of an owner to notify any person of the existence of the easements, conditions, restrictions, and miss shall no way limit or divest the right of master association to the enforcement of I'm legal terms. So, but it's 3.26. And it, what it's basically saying, Christine, exactly what you're saying. If someone comes into your unit and you're going to give them to write the right to unit, to, to use that unit, you still have to notify somebody of that. In the association, I would think. Uh, I believe it's the master association. But I mean, I'm just talking about my particular situation because everyone that comes in for my family is on a green card and we go and get green cards. And so the master association knows that they're there. Um, well, 3.26 says that even if you're occupying somebody's residence with the permission of the owner, you're still subject to all the rules and regulations of Foxfire. And I guess that what Ray is suggesting that as long as it's not a commercial lease, which is what most of the rest of the documents talk about, that, that it's okay to do that. And again, I, I just want to be really honest and upfront because as everyone knows, my family all comes down and that is how we handle it, you know, I mean, and, and if there's not something available at Foxfire, then, you know, they, they'll take a hotel room or something. But I, I just want to make sure that as, as owners that we have some flexibility with respect to our neighbors and to Foxfire to be able to let other people use the unit if, if we feel it's appropriate. Now, I'm, you know, I'm coming at it from a standpoint where, you know, I, I'm respectful of, I want everyone to make sure that this not, whoever's in my unit, which isn't that often, it doesn't disrupt Foxfire or operations. Mm -hmm. So again, I just wanted to clarify that for my own self and for any other owners that might use that accommodation for other people. But I think that what I hear you saying is that in that situation, we let the association know that we're letting someone use our unit and that if, you know, we're using green cards, but 
you know, that then, you know, that if it's a tra transfer, then it's a transfer fee. It's just like this. Exactly. I don't think you're um, recommending that this person that, that's a family member uh, and they're in another unit pay no. $200. Well, no, nobody's asking for that. No, no it's, I, a nor green card, it's a green card. Nor are they transferring any of the rights okay. to use right. the golf course, right? right. 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 When right. your friends come down, they're not using the golf course. No, no. No, no, it, it, but but I, I, I think the point is here, and Donald brought up, it's, it's local level enforcement right. that if someone's in the unit, Say to the sub association, hey, that's the that's the sub association's fine of, of responsibility. <laughs> but hey, somebody's in my unit. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's only protects the community. Mm -hmm. No, no, Christine, that's not that's not the point. The point is that we don't want to have somebody come back and say, oh, I'm not going to let them know. Just go use my unit, and, and uh, you know, next thing you know, the person's in there for a month, but it's but a side deal has been made for money. That's somehow you have to draw the line. That's the no, point. I I understand. I. I just want to clarify it all because, I mean, I'm on the board. I don't want to be in non-compliance. That would be a really bad optic, you know. Um, so I just want to, you know, and we'll just I have speak this about that. Goal that's there on an annual basis, and I was going to pay the four hundred dollars, and I, I don't think I'm supposed to, and I still was going to pay it though, <laughs> because God forbid my mother's on the street corner saying I, my son kicked grass, kicked grass, right? You got it. So I agree with you. All right, anyway. Well, I think my, my, I, I have a huge problem with the VRBO and that kind of rental. And I think that there should be, um, they, they should actively, the association, sub associations should actively pursue that within their owners and, and their sub associations that are doing that practice. I've heard some horror stories at some of the um, condo buildings of those type of rentals. And I think that this is a good step in the next direction to control that. I, I don't understand annual rentals at all, to be honest with you, but you know, that's just me. But I think, you know, it, it what we're, we're, we're trying to do is create a culture within Foxfire the way we want it to be. And we don't want it to be transient in and out people coming and going. That's sort of what I, I think part of the purpose is also. So we're good to go to give this to, yeah. to Steve for. Right? Well, what Ray has done solves a specific problem. Uh, and yeah. It doesn't solve all problems. No, right, right. Uh, in the right direction. Uh, so uh, this will go to Steve Falk once, once it's cleaned up. Yeah. And, uh, we'll get it's, to you uh, the more imprimatur. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the next uh, issue is... Uh, uh, legacy and memorial committees. I, I had asked that uh, these two committees uh, get together and uh, kind of resolve uh, uh, the ground rules for the, the two committees since uh, uh, it seemed like uh, uh, there was a, a strong feeling that the two committees stay separate. So, uh, Jim, did you want to? Well, yes, we, we did have our meeting. It took a long time to set up, um, but finally accomplished a meeting last week, I believe it was, at which time we were to discuss two things. One, how we might define the roles of the two separate committees so that there was less or no confusion in the minds of the Foxfire public about what the roles and jurisdictions of those two com committees were, or We'll also talk about the possibility of keeping the two committees distinct, yet have them under one umbrella, one administrative, one committee administering both. And so with that purpose in mind, we finally were able to convene a meeting. Three, uh, myself as liaison for the Legacy Fund and, um, and the, our chairman, Mary Bills, and our vice chairman, Keith Bailey, were there. And uh, Mark Schwab on, as liaison to the um, uh, Memorial Fund and their chairman, Len McClay, and I think about three or four members of his committee were also present. And we met in the, um, in the conference room. Um, I have probably been at less productive and nastier meetings in my life, but honestly can't remember 
when I've been at one that was this. Uh, this was a remarkably unproductive meeting and it began as I was trying to get, say a few words of introduction on how we got here and what the purpose was when I was summarily told to just sit back, be quiet. He didn't want to hear from me anymore. And the meeting kind of went downhill from there. Uh, I would have to say that it was, an, it was a nasty confrontation. It was unpleasant and it was unproductive. Um, without naming any names, it was abundantly clear that the members of the Memorial Fund um, did not want to change anything. We're not interested in talking about any changes. We're not interested in trying to compromise, wanted to do business as they always had and wanted to be left alone. And I think did not want to be at the meeting. And it was absolutely clear that by the end of the meeting uh, that that was, we were not going to accomplish anything, which is in fact what the result was, except um, I think Mary Bill suggested that for purposes of making life easier for Stella, she would tell Stella that any contributions below $500 should go to the Memorial Fund and anything 500 or greater should go to the Legacy Fund. And, and I believe Mary has already done that. Well, so, sorry to report that, um, on that. On that note, it was proposed to the Legacy Committee from the Memorial Fund. Well, I actually made the proposal. I threw out a number, $1,000, anything above $1,000. That sort of differentiates between a legacy and a memorial. And then the Memorial Fund went and wanted to up it to a $5,000 minimum, you know, because their contention is it's a legacy. You know, it's not like it's a, uh, someone's given 25 bucks, you know, for something, you know, just for memorial. Um, the $500 line came from the Memorial Fund, not from, or came from the uh, legacy fund, not the Memorial Fund. Right. I probably I think it should still be about a thousand dollars, and that I think right. that's fair for both parties. But that's me. The mayor bills did indicate she would do that. But the, the memorial fund was vehement. This has been running for thirty-five years with no problems and running very smoothly, and now all of a sudden, you know, they want to change, you know, in midstream. And uh, I can understand that because it has been running very well for so many years. Uh, the legacy fund. You know, I'm not totally comfortable with the legacy fund, you know, but that's me. I think it's, you know, you're looking for big money. And if that's the case, then that you have to wait for the one big score and keep working at it and keep turning over rocks and stirring the pot and see what you come up with. But uh, I think in no way it should, as does Len, the chairperson and the, board, and the rest of the committee, that it should affect the memorial fund in any way, shape or form. And there, as I say, I thought my content, my proposal at thousand dollars was reasonable. Uh, in my same breath, I think their five thousand dollar request was a little unreasonable. But uh, you know, we have no say in that matter anyway. We're just liaisons, and uh, we're trying to come to some terms. And the Memorial Fund just came up with a five hundred dollar figure, and I, I think that's too cheap. I think that's actually infringing on the Memorial funds turf well, what, well let, let me just i i want to just finish my comment i apologize for that. Uh, uh, i was trying to finish my report at no point did we ever suggest doing away with the memorial fund or changing the way they do business that was not our intent our intent was to try and distinguish in the in the public's mind how the two different committees operate or possibly to keep their committee together but put it under one umbrella instead of two. But be that as it may, um, the, the, the upshot of the whole meeting was in the story report that we were unable to reach consensus on anything. They did not want to talk about it. They did not want to change their ways. And so it will be up to the, the Legacy Fund when we reconvene in October or November um, to try and sort out where we stand, what it is we can do to distinguish ourselves and to proceed on our own because it's clear the memorial fund does not want to be a participant in this conversation. So we'll do our best and I'll get back to you in, in the fall and I apologize for being unsuccessful. Is there any understanding uh, if somebody specifically wants funds to go to the legacy uh, fund, 
can we contribute it? Or if, if we mistakenly, uh, uh, I'll use a, a neutral source, Pam Cannon, uh, a thought came together uh, that a contribution collectively could go towards Pam Cannon's name on a legacy and maybe you name the room building uh, for her. Um, and um, uh, I consider Pam a, a dear friend. Um, I made a separate legacy contribution for, for my own family, which was a little bit higher, but um, I threw in $250 to the Pam Cannon Legacy Fund. And I think a number of other people we're doing the same thing. I, I have no idea what's in there. You're absolutely correct. Can I, should I have not done that? Is that what you're saying? And I'm, that, it's a rhetorical question I'm throwing out to both Mark and to, uh, to Jim. Uh, I'll, all I can tell you, Roger, is that has not been decided yet. Okay. We're, but that's something we're going to have to okay. work out on our own, apparently. And we will do our best and we'll come back to this board if we need to, to get to propose some clarification. But right now, I can't assure you that if somebody said I'm going to give 250, which is under the $500 amount, and I want to go to the legacy fund, I can't assure you that it would go to the legacy fund just because of the inability to reach an agreement like this. And I, I'd rather not withdraw the money from the legacy fund, but I don't well, know. Well, I, how, think, how, I how think I do this thing that or Pam, whoever proposed this. <laughs> it's a it's a conundrum at the moment, and I'm sorry that I was not able to resolve it. I okay. will keep working. On it. Okay. At least where things stand at the moment, uh, contribution to go to the legacy fund has to be at least five hundred dollars. Correct. A single contribution. Correct. And that lump contributions less than five hundred go to the memorial. Go to the memorial fund. Right. That's that's the way things stand at the moment. Exactly. Okay. But, but anything that's happened up to that point, anything like right, case, right. That, so that, 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 as of, that was as of June 9th. Right. June 9th, these are the rules. Right. Yeah. Can, I, can I just ask a question? Because because maybe I get stuck with reading documents and thinking that we, we stay to the level of the document. But I'm looking at the Memorial Fund Committee Charter, which is on the website. And I pulled it off because, and it talks about the fact that three meetings are handed annually, but maybe more appropriate. It's interesting because it says a representative of the Green Committee should be on there. The golf course superintendent or his designee and a board of directors should be on there. I don't even know if they're even on that committee when you say seven people. But that's what the, mm -hmm. that's what the document says. But the responsibilities is what really made me wonder. Because it says to propose, propose projects for the enhancement of the Foxfire community as in the planting of trees, shrubs, perennials, garden, or the construction of fountains and or other memorial entities deemed appropriate. That's what the memorial committee is a responsibility. It goes further to say to keep a permanent record of the donors and the event or person being memorialized along with the date of same. This record will be entered permanently in an alphabetized manner in a directory available at the Foxfire Clubhouse office. Do we do that? Stella has a record of that. <laughs> but, but I guess my point is, and I've said this, I'm the newbie here, but I've never seen any report from the Memorial Committee that says, this is where we spent our money, and this is how much money we have. Yeah. So why, why don't we get well, that? Well, Pam, Pam would yeah, well, identify well, that. Mr. McClay, every, every, fall, every fall, Mr. McClay would write a report, He'd write, okay. like, like, a, like a end of the year report. Every fall, so this is what we spent. Da, da, da. So but did the member see? Member oh yeah, it was in Fox. Mr. Yeah, every Fox. Yeah. It was in Fox. Yeah, so once okay. a year he would write a he would write a report that said, you okay. know, this is this is what we what we and it's only like September or October okay. Fox sales. So we know where the where we should be spending the in money all, per. And in, in all the funds you got to remember all the funds that the memorial committee spends those also have that has to be approved by the board as well. So whatever they spend. So and there's a historical record of the minutes as well. So the more, more, Memorial Committee has not spent any money since December. We had, right. 
other than the last week, because they want, we have a couple of fountains that we're looking at, but we have to pick up the electrical and, and obviously some of the prices. So in the last six months, the Memorial Committee hasn't spent any it's, money. It's just, and they've right. got about $50,000. Right, exactly right. Exactly right. But they have, but but the idea was that there's two fountains that they're considering installing, okay. and there's some and some landscaping that okay. they like to do. Good. It's just a matter that we don't want to see, we 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 don't want to get into landscaping because everything's going to be torn up around here. And then the other thing is because of the irrigation system, we don't have water supply in different areas. So if we were to re renovate the Memorial Garden, <laughs> we'd use up the water. We, well, if we renovate the more, we have nothing to water the plants in with. Okay, so, right. so, so, right, so it. it's one of those things. I got it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, this is not the last uh, we'll hear of this, I'm sure. Uh, Moving on to the foreclosure proceedings and attorney's fees. Uh, this came up at the last meeting. Uh, I believe you raised it, Jim. Yeah, uh, Donald, Donald and I, Donald was asking you to get involved. And if it's okay with Donald, I'm just going to go ahead and have to kind of bring you up to date. Um, we have two properties that are um, the subject of potential foreclosures. And I'm not going to refer to those by owner name, but by, rather by location. One of them happens to be in Fox Haven, one happens to be on Fox Fire Lane. I'm going to talk first about the Fox Haven property where the delinquency amount owed to Fox Fire is about $12,500 and has been, um, small amounts have been paid over time, but it really has been delinquent for quite a long time. And if, if one adds attorney's fees and costs on uh, the amount approaches $14,500. We have, because it's a situation uh, in Fox Haven, we have a, a smaller range of what that property is worth. And we do know that at some point there was a first mortgage on the, on the Fox Haven condominium, which in its original amount, and this was almost 20 years ago, its original amount was $97,000. We have no idea what the present value of the balance of that mortgage is, but if one assumes it's in the $90,000 range today, and you add on our um, 14,000 that is owed us, uh, you, we start to get up toward what the value of the property is. There's another wrinkle in that Fox Haven Condominium Association has its own lien on the property, which was recorded after ours in the amount of uh, $4,600. So all in all, it's a, it's a situation where there doesn't appear to be a lot of equity um, in the property. That And so we need to be a little bit concerned about what we do here. Um, normally, when liens are recorded in, in a, in a what we're talking about here is is a lien like a mortgage. It's a it's a document filed in the Register of Deeds Office that becomes an encumbrance on the property, just like a mortgage is. When those liens are filed, their the priority is based on the order of filing. The first mortgage being the first priority of anyone who gets paid. We normally would have been the second because our lien was filed second, and third would have been Fox Haven. But as we talked to Steve Falk the other day, he told us of a quirk. And I really mean a court in Florida law, which would require us to pay off the condominium association first, even though they were filed after us. Um, so that we in effect now are the third in line uh, for this, if there is a foreclosure. Um, we, after talking this all through with Steve, uh, we decided to do two things. One is issue a formal demand letter to the owners of that condominium so that they're aware that we are contemplating um, foreclosure proceedings, just in the hope that they might step up their payments or come to some other terms with us for payment of the balance too. <coughs> and if we would also write a second letter, uh, which is may not be subject to some very strict federal laws on debt collection practices. Uh, a second letter, which tries to solicit a little more information. Most importantly, the value or the balance of that first mortgage. So we have some idea of how much equity in the property 
we're dealing with here. We, we don't want to jeopardize our, our equity in the property because it jeopardizes the, the, the funds or the investment of everyone here at Foxfire. That, that is an obligation owed to Foxfire and we want to make sure we can keep it protected. So we're going to try and find out a little bit more information as we can about the financial situation with respect, to, especially to that first mortgage and the ability to pay. So that second letter will go out next week. The first letter has already gone out. The demand, the formal demand letter that complies with the federal statutes. Um, if we can work something out, we will. If we believe that our position is deteriorating in terms of the amount of equity left in the property, we may want to ask the board to authorize a foreclosure action, but we won't know that until the next time we meet. We will keep posted. Um, since that, we have apparently learned that there may be some interest in buying that property, and which would be great because that would take care of everything. Um, and so we'll also keep that in mind as well. But we wanted to let you know that because of the potential that this thing, we might be losing our security for the amount that is owed us, we wanted to get going on this thing. And that, we thought that was the prudent thing to do, so we have initiated that demand. Mm -hmm. Jim, is anyone occupying that Fox Haven? Donald, no, and I believe there is. Yes. Yeah. yeah, they have. So they're enjoying the sunshine. Yeah, they have. Them. So anybody else have any questions was, about that one? Is that, did you say we, li we know it's listed? On what, what was it? No, no, we don't know. But okay. we've, uh, I've been, we think it's. I've been told that there's some. There's some people that that is, that is, around and inquiries being made okay. and things such yeah. as that, which leads to itself. Do we know what kind of condition the unit is in? No, I know. Okay. Yeah. No. Nor would we permit it usually to find out. But we'll, we'll try, we're trying to get some more information. Now, the, ex, the other property uh, is on Foxfire Lane, and there is no mortgage. Oh, by the way, the, the first property that I talked about, the taxes are paid to date. And so the taxes would normally be a priority lien even ahead of a first mortgage. But that's, there's, Apparently no lien for taxes in that case. The second uh, property is on Foxfire Lane. Um, that indebtedness to us, I understand, is in the $20,000 plus range. Um, it is, uh, it, the, the, the owner is deceased. The record owner of the property is deceased. There was a probate started because the, pro the property itself was apparently in his will. And the, pro and the probate proceedings, which would normally have transferred ownership to the heirs, uh, four or five children, um, was dismissed for lack of any action. It was sat there for nine months and courts will often just dismiss things when nobody's doing anything on the case and that was dismissed. So there are no probate proceedings pending. But since there are no, first, there's no mortgage on the property and apparently the issue of taxes doesn't arise, there appears to be plenty of equity for our indebtedness. It's just a matter of when are we going to get paid. And it is occupied by one of the children, we believe, uh, and they have made small payments and then stopped making payments entirely. Um, I think what we decided to do, uh, it, oh, uh, we, uh, we authorized our attorney, Steve Falk, to talk to the attorney who represented the estate proceedings to find out what happened and what they intend to do. Because right now, the property is still in the name of a deceased person and it is not in the names of anyone. If we were to foreclose, we would have to start a foreclosure action against the four or five children. I forget how many there are. And, and they live in all parts of the country and we'd have to start for four. And, and I'm not afraid of doing that. That's fine. It's just a little more expensive, but all of the expenses of these uh, foreclosure proceedings get added to our judgment. So we recover them back when the property is sold. So we've, we've authorized Steve to talk to that attorney who, and find out what's going on. If she still represents them, if they're going to start another probate, where things stand. And then he's also going to contact the person living there now and see if that person is willing to start making some more serious payments to pay down the obligation to Foxfire. And so we have not authorized anything beyond that at this point. Um, and we, if we have to foreclose, it looks like we have plenty of equity in that property. I'm not concerned about jeopardizing the investment of 
people here at Foxfire over that one. We will be able to cover all of our all of our fees, all of our amounts due us plus our attorneys fees. Anybody any any questions about that? Well, thank you very much for doing all that for work. Any questions? We'll move on then to uh, the committee reports. Uh, uh, there is no uh, report of the Medical Advisory Committee. The Construction Committee uh, uh, report was covered largely by Donald uh, earlier. Uh, Strategic Planning Committee. Happy. Happy um, had a leave. Uh, okay. Um, Green Committee is Tappy uh, Finance Committee. Uh, prior to the uh, to the meeting, I sent Mark and, and Christine and uh, Tappy uh, a brief overview of some figures, and I passed them out here. And uh, uh, Linda has a copy of them as well. I'm not going to go through the through it line by line, but I want to make everybody aware of uh, you are aware of uh, the challenges that we had with. Pam's, uh, Pam Cannon's uh, passing. Uh, it created a bit of a delay in some of our monthly reports uh, and our quarterly reports. We are about ready to uh, uh, send out the second quarterly report. Uh, Donald and I have spoken and uh, uh, I just wanna put a brief uh, cover letter on where, where we are in terms of our balance sheet because uh, we owe all the members uh, a report on uh, the financial uh, integrity of, uh, of our organization. Uh, but today I'd like to comment on the balance sheet, the income statement, and uh, the budget. And I'm not gonna read all the numbers, but I wanna uh, give you perspective on it. Uh, on our balance sheet, which Foxfire has historically been very, very proud of, and it's been very, very strong, it remains strong. Through the first eight months of this year, fiscal year, October through May, we have over $7.6 million in cash. Uh, and you always want to have cash on hand. Uh, my father always used to tell me, and growing up in Chicago, kid, if you're walking around and you don't have a couple of bucks in your pocket, you're a dope. <laughs> so have cash. Um, and, and we're in good shape. Uh, nearly 50% of our members did pay the special assessments in full, which is wonderful. Uh, that helps the cash further. Uh, the big one that I wanna point out to you is uh, uh, the financial community uh, would, would always, always talks about current ratios. Current ratios are simplistic, nothing more than what are our total current assets divided by what are our current total liabilities. And that gives you a ratio. Uh, the ratio that we are operating on, we are plus 3.27. The club industry around the country averages 2.2. They're far below. Uh, and the higher your current ratio, the more attractive you are to lenders, the more attractive you uh, are to uh, every, every one of the owners. Uh, so that balance sheet is just rock solid. Uh, we want to keep it high uh, and, uh, and, and move forward with it. The second thing I want to comment about is the income statement for the October through May period. And, and Donald has given us some thoughts about uh, some great savings that, uh, that, that operations has uh, delivered through the first six months. I just want to re-itinerate that uh, because this is so impressive to see what operations has been able to deliver for us this year. Um, our total revenues uh, are down, they're short uh, from the budget by $239,000. Uh, we can't, uh, we couldn't serve food uh, as often. We had to, we didn't have parties that were available. Uh, we couldn't uh, uh, get guest fees uh, into the club, et cetera. It's, a, it's down $239 to what the budget was. But importantly, what operations did uh, over these first eight months were $486,000 better than budget in terms of expenses. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge savings. 
Uh, and it, what it does is it delivered a $536,000 profit, uh, operating, operating profit uh, versus the budget of 206. Uh, and that's been a huge win for us. And what it really represents is that after eight months, operations has driven this organization forward with a $330,000 uh, good position. And, and that's, uh, uh, Donald, we said uh, thanks uh, a couple of times today, but boy, I have to keep on saying that. Well, all of this sets up where we have to go in terms of budget and where we have to go uh, down the road in terms of a second loan with uh, Iberia Bank. Uh, so we wanna stay healthy um, and we're positioned to do that. In the budget, uh, a budget proposal has been prepared by the Finance Committee. And as uh, Dr. Cornetta has uh, stated, we're going to have a special board meeting next week so we can just spend time for all of the board members to thoroughly go through uh, the budget, proposed budget on a line by line basis. So if you have questions on it, you'll be able to, uh, to look at it and, uh, and digest it. Uh, this is this point A that I, I've, I've laid out. The proposal calls for a 3.4% increase on a year over year basis. This is the lowest percentage increase that we've asked of membership to pay in terms of their fees uh, in the past five years. Past five years, we've averaged 4.9%. Um, just a tremendous uh, deal of uh, gratitude should be extended to Helsi uh, Barcella. Uh, she stepped in in a, in a difficult time for, uh, for everybody uh, as Pam uh, passed away. Uh, and she's going to, uh, Donald is in the position where he's, uh, he's ready to, uh, to recommend her for, uh, for a promotion. It's well-deserved. Uh, and uh, when you see Kelsey, uh, thank her because she's done a great job for us. But we also owe some tremendous uh, gratitude to the, uh, to the finance committee uh, they all worked with every single department in building this budget proposal that, uh, that you're going to be looking at over the course of the next, uh, next week. And uh, a special thanks to, uh, uh, to Lynn Anderson and Helen Wessling. They did absolutely yeoman uh, work in bringing this, uh, this budget together. There were meetings after meetings after meetings. Uh, an extensive amount of time that, uh, that they uh, took to, uh, to work with banks, to, uh, to work with uh, the, general, the general ledger. Uh, and as you look at this, uh, this budget proposal, I think you're gonna be as impressed as, uh, uh, as Dr. Canetta and, uh, and, and myself have been in, uh, in looking at it in a preliminary fashion. The areas of focus built into this budget uh, there's several, there's, there's, there's a good deal of them, but primary in our minds, in the finance community's minds, were associate retention. And I know that you are, every one of you are reading uh, on a daily basis, uh, uh, either online or in, in print publications, how difficult it is to get people back into the workforce, particularly in the hospitality business. Uh, so we wanted to make certain that we were protecting that interest of all of our members, uh, and this budget will help us do that. Uh, every department uh, head has been involved in this, as I've said. Uh, they've thought through some processes of what I will refer to and what they are referring to as start, stop, and sustain. And the stop one is a tough one but they're already taking action on it. Uh, what should we be stopping? Uh, Dr. Cornetta had pointed out, you know, do we really need to be printing up uh, uh, the uh, foxtails 
uh, on an ongoing basis? Can we get more people going online? Can we get a savings there? Do we really need to print up a directory uh, this year, every single year? Uh, and these are significant dollars. Uh, and then they filter into postage. The postage in this organization is over $13,000 a year just for the postage stamp. But it really costs another uh, 150% in terms of labor and paper to put that out. Uh, we need, we board members should take a lead in this if we're not already there. Don't ask for your monthly statement to be mailed to you. Take it online. I've been paying, uh, paying online and, uh, and it saves time for, uh, for the operations team uh, and it saves postage and it saves, saves printing time. We need to look at stopping the use of styrofoam cups. Uh, and uh, the, the operations team has put together an ad hoc uh, committee saying, figure out a way that we can reduce our usage of styrofoam cups. Now, obviously we're gonna have guests that are gonna come in here and they're gonna want a cup of coffee or they're gonna want water and we will have styrofoam cups, but they're looking at it and saying, you know what, these things don't break down. Uh, and so it's an environmental challenge. I look at it that way a little bit, not as much perhaps as I should, but it's $7,000 in money that we're spending on styrofoam cups on, a, on an annualized basis. There's some other ways that we can do some things. Um, the finance committee uh, jumped on the concept and the understanding that we have inflation in this country and it's impacting us here and now. Uh, we're fortunate that we're not doing some of the master plan building this summer because we'd be paying a heck of a lot more for steel and for uh, uh, for lumber prices, and those will come down. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, Janet Yellen and uh, and Powell are correct that uh, that it is transitory and uh, on, on some of those things. But some of the things are there. Our food costs are going up, and they're not going to go back down. Um, they're marshaling money for uh, cash contingencies for the future. So we'll be ready when we go back to Iberia um, in, uh, uh, in 2022 and say, okay, we're ready to take on our next loan to prepay a bunch of uh, uh, folks who are gonna say, I need this in order to build your fitness center. I need this to build your, uh, your halfway house. Uh, so it's, it's all cooked into the budget proposal you're going to hear a lot more about it next week. Uh, we're asking uh, Lynn Anderson to join us uh, and uh, and walk us through it. Uh, she's got a much uh, stronger and better understanding of uh, some of the numbers behind it. We'll try to answer any questions that the board members have. Uh, you will have throughout June and July up to the August board meeting to really think through do I really love this, uh, uh, this proposed budget? We will not vote on the final budget until the August board meeting. Um, but a great job was done by the finance committee, uh, by operations, uh, and certainly by each of the, uh, the, the department heads. So that's um, a look at this. You will be seeing a note coming from, uh, that'll be posted online for the second quarter financials. We're not going to mail it out. And it's the recommendation of the finance committee and myself as treasurer to send the third quarter uh, statement online and encourage people. We can blast out the email and say, take a look at the budget proposal, which we can send to them and the balance sheet and the financial statements online. We want to get people to the internet site. Roger? Yes. Unfortunately, you have to get that in writing if they'll accept electronic, uh, you know, notices. Uh, we, I, I understand that. We can send out the second quarter report 
uh, without a notice to them ahead of time. Right. I, but the budget and things like that. The budget needs to, uh, to, to have that approval. Yeah, they have to, the owner has to notify you that you they will accept electronic notification. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, reminding us a, of that. A couple of questions. First of all, thanks for all the work you put in on this. It's great. I uh, feel such a sense of comfort and we're in good hands. From it. I have a, just a couple of questions. You said that Donald was going to promote LC and you have to hear it says he recently did promote. Has she received that promotion? I've, I've got a, it's coming up in the next couple of weeks where I'm doing a 90 day review. Oh, okay. So I shouldn't go in and say congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly yeah. what I yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, and then the other th question I have, Roger, what, when the, now that the PPP loan has been forgiven and turned into a grant, how does that impact uh, either the, the income statement or the balance sheet? Is it, it, I assume it's, it turns a liability. There's no more liability on it. It will have the, uh, the impact of uh, uh, enhancing the cash flow. Think of it that way. All right, we, well, we had to spend the money uh, on payroll because it was part of general operating funds, right. uh, which we wanted to do. Uh, but we'll, we will, in fact, be putting additional funds into the contingency fund. So it, it, it will, we eliminate a liability on the balance sheet, so it improves our current ratio. That's correct. And it, it will also, it'll now uh, improve the cash flow by that amount because it had been alone now, or will yeah, that? You, you can see it that way. Okay. That's, that's okay. the way you should see it. Thank you. And the benefit of uh, putting uh, funds in the, the contingency fund is that it can be used for any purposes, mm -hmm. including operations. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's not restricted. Right. Thank you. The, Donald, when will the board receive the budget? Uh, more than likely the uh, first part of the week. Okay. So yeah, we'll have yeah, a few yeah, days, yeah, a few days for sure. Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're cleaning a few things up yesterday. Yeah. So. I, I just want to uh, endorse what Roger said about the Finance Committee and most especially uh, Lena Anderson and, uh, and Helen Wesley. Um, they, they, the job that they did is truly incredible, and the, the work and time that they put into it. Um, uh, they literally went through every number on every line uh, and, uh, and scrutinized it and debated it uh, in light of, uh, you know, what if uh, the pandemic continues, if it doesn't, if the golf course is closed, it's not, uh, you know, the, the iterations they went through, I believe. Uh, the version that we'll be getting is draft 16 of the budget. Right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> and they really, uh, really worked it uh, uh, remarkably. So thanks to them and, and, and the whole finance committee. And, and of course, Roger as treasurer. All, all, of, uh, all of the board members I know were approached by membership from time to time. How much is my fee gonna go up? 3.4% in these times of inflation is very, very modest, very modest. All right, in addition to that, that fee is not that large in comparison to the other communities. That, that's true. I mean, we're talking about the increase, but we're starting at a low level and we're still going at a very reasonable increase. Right? Well, that's the other thing to consider. That's really important. And it's also in light of the fact that the, uh, the Florida constitution mandates a uh, gradual increase in the minimum wage over the next five years. Right. So, you know, we've had to take that into consideration and the impact that has uh, on the entire staff, not right. just uh, certain individuals. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's been a factor in this 3.4% as well. And we didn't have a choice there. Right. Uh, so, okay. Thank you, Roger. Any questions for Roger? Okay. You want to continue with house social house uh, will not meet again until uh, until September um, uh, insurance committee will be uh, uh, an ad hoc situation until we get into uh, to the new year so I have nothing else for them. ARC uh, just a the ARC is continuing to do its usual things without any problem but we do have one matter that requires your attention and that is 
a new owner down here, a gentleman by the name of Ted Bockweg, B-O-C-K-W-E-G, who had applied for and was a part of the communications committee, uh, has, uh, I guess, found an interest in the ARC committee, interviewed with them, would like to move from communications to the ARC. Uh, the, I have an email from Chad Callanan, which says in part, please allow Ted to step away from the communications committee and nominate him to the ARC, saying he would be an, an extraordinary experience. Uh, his experience is extraordinary and would be a help to, to the ARC. Uh, Mike Gallion has asked me to approve his transfer to the ARC. So we have both committee chairs and Mr. Bachwick wanting to make the move from uh, communications to the ARC. And I would therefore move that uh, we permit the transfer. Okay. Motion to transfer the, uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Ted Bachwick. Bachwick. B-O-C-K-W-E-G. Uh, to uh, ARC, uh, is there a second? Second. I second the motion. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 You are opposed. Done. Legacy fund, I've already covered that. Mm -hmm. Rules committee has not met, so there's no activity to report. Okay. Golf committee, right? I uh, will not meet till the fall, but we did receive some very interesting information from Lynn Anderson with regards to what you heard earlier with the $400 transfer fee. Very, very well done, the document that she gave us. And it gives us an excellent analysis of this past year. Yes, members, tenants, really, really good day. That's it. Okay. Well, President's Council uh, will not meet again until about September. You heard me say earlier that, that I continue to pump information to them and become a media point. And I'm seeing some interesting comments. One was, Roger, from your comments about the, the, uh, the expenses that we put in, uh, we should consider when we sell a home and all that. Uh, the President's Council is looking at that in their little world and what, so it led to that. So that's good, good, good stuff. Okay, thank you. Safety Committee? Uh, next meeting is in July. Okay, Tennis Committee? Uh, probably not until the fall and one of the place to play anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Audubon and Nature Committees? Yeah. Mark. Uh, Memorial Fund, uh, I guess we've already heard. Uh, statutory rules. They, the nature of Audubon hasn't met. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, communications Committee. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the Communications Committee, first and foremost, would like to thank uh, Jeremy for um, his work putting together all these pictures and videos of the ongoing work. Um, I have it up on the screen now. If you've not visited the master plan website under the golf tab, please do so. Um, Kathy is continually updating this. Um, and it's, for those of you that are, for those of us that are not there, this is just really a, a, a really nice way to stay in touch with, um, with Foxfire. And I, I, again, thank you to Jeremy and all of his hard work in um, putting all this together for us. And uh, let me see if I can get out of this now. Um, yeah, Kathy uh, is back up north now and, um, but still working diligently on, um, are, are we still on Zoom here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, here. Okay. Here we are. I'm sorry. Um, I have to stop this share. Sorry. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not Kathy O'Brien, so you have to bear with me here. Um, she's still working diligently uh, and she continues to work with Donald on the timeline. Um, I think those are being v updated on a timely basis. And um, soon she'll start concentrating on working uh, with CSG to audit the website so that um, those funds were approved last month and we get better analytics and a better understanding how the website works. Pat Witt uh, generated 12 training modules that deal with different areas of the website. You know, Dr. Cornetta, you spoke earlier about 
greater use of the website and using it as a tool within our community to keep um, keep everyone abreast of what's going on, give them the tools that they need to be as fully engaged here at Foxfire as they can. Um, I might ask Donald, maybe what we can do in one of your next GM messages, weekly uh, emails, maybe we could um, make a note of that and make have a link there to, to the modules so that people can take a look at it. Uh, there are different topics how to use Chelsea, how to sign up for events, how to update your membership on the roster. And I encourage everyone, if you're still on the call and you haven't been to the me member roster page, please go there and make sure your information is correct, that we have all your emails and contact information that we need. Um, we also, you know, and Ray touched on it a little bit earlier, he went to the website, was it for a memorial fund or something to see what they've done. We encourage all committees to reach out to the communications to committee or to Nina to help update their information on the website. You know, um, what they're doing, what their projects are. It, it's, it, we, we want it to be a resource like Dr. Cornetta said. And, you know, and I'm, I was so encouraged today to hear both Dr. Cornetta and Roger speak to the importance of this online uh, tool that we have for our members. Um, health and wellness, um, Roger, you spoke about the styrofoam cups. Uh, Eileen Staler from health and wellness has done some considerable research in terms of alternatives and costs. Um, perhaps we can give her a seat at the table to have that conversation with whoever was at the house committee was looking at that. Well, Melissa told me, it actually told me about the styrofoam. Um, okay. Issue. I think okay. That, that's covered. And then uh, Betsy Cole also is requesting a place at the table for when uh, the commu construction committee is discussing um, the fitness center. There is a wealth of talent information and in health and wellness that could add valuable insight into a direction in, in, in the fitness center in terms of many different areas. She did send a recommended uh, list of ideas to uh, Tappy, Frank Kennedy, and I think Donald perhaps uh, sometime back, she's not heard back. So I would ask um, if, if when it gets to that point or even now, if she could please be included in some of those discussions, I think it would be add value. Um, and um, the Foxtails editorial board, um, I am pleased to bring forward the name of Ann Hannon for appointment to the Foxtails editorial board. Anne is new to the Foxfire community, about six months or so now. Um, I, I've, I've spoken with her. She's been vetted through um, Judy Medeiros. She has a wealth of background and experience that would add value to the, um, communi uh, to the Foxtails editorial board. And she's ready to just jump right in with both feet. And since Don Naus um, has, uh, resigned because of his position on the golf committee, we could really use uh, we could really use her. So I put forth the name of Ann Hannon for um, appointment to the Foxtails editorial board. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And that's all I've got. That's a wrap for me. Just a question. Yeah. Is the television site going to be weaned out of the situation or what's happening well, with the the 190 um, 195 196 is a product that cannot be upgraded or fixed there is no viable solution for that i know that it's been something that has been um, culturally here very well embraced by our members however as we've been discussing today and in the past and the communications committee has come away on this, things change and things are changing online. Um, we do not see a viable option. There is no viable option to keep those channels moving forward. It's embarrassing, the quality of it. It's, um, it's gonna go away sooner than later is basically my answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, any correspondence beyond what's already in the book? Uh, are there any members who wish to exercise the right to speak? 
Uh, there is no one that has indicated that, Dr. Cornetta. Well, then I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Uh, uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, we have a special board meeting next Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, and those of you uh, who obviously will zoom in, I have no problem, we'll have it here in this room. Uh, next board meeting is not until August. Uh, so motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. Second, all in favor. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.